I think you will enjoy enjoy him after what you've been uh, hearing these last few days. So we can design all of that. And there is another one that is absolutely crucial. It's a mathematical reality called exponential growth. If something is growing at 1% a year, it'll double in 70 years. 2% a year, it'll double in 35 years. 3% a year in 24 years. 4%, 17 and a half years. Anything growing exponentially will double in a predictable length of time. Now I'm going to show you why all of this stuff about we gotta keep growing, keep the economy growing, we've gotta keep everything growing is ultimately suicidal. I'm going to give you a system analogous to the planet, and that's a test tube full of food for bacteria. So the test tube and food is a planet, and bacteria are us. Now I'm going to introduce one bacterial cell in, and it's going to divide every minute. That's exponential growth. So at time zero at the beginning, there's one cell. One minute, there are two. Two minutes, there are four. Three minutes, there are eight. Four minutes, 16. That's exponential growth. And in 60 minutes, the test tube is completely packed with bacteria and there's no food left. So we have a 60 minute growth cycle. When is the test tube only half full? Well, of course, the answer is at 59 minutes. Even though it's been chugging along for 59 minutes, it's only half full, but one minute later, it'll be completely filled. So that means at 58 minutes, it's 25%. 57 minutes is 12 and a half percent full. At 55 minutes of a 60 minute cycle, it's 3% full. At uh, 55 minutes, one of the bacteria says, hey guys, I've been thinking, we got a problem. We got a population problem. The other bacteria would say, Jack, what the hell have you been smoking, man? 97% of the test tube's empty, and we've been around for 55 minutes. And they'd be five minutes away from filling it. So, say bacteria are no smarter than humans at 59 minutes, they go, oh my God, Jack was right. We got one minute left, what are we gonna do? Well, don't give any money to those economists that are saying we gotta keep growing all the time. Uh, give it to those scientists. So they massively inject money into the scientific community. Guess what? In less than a minute, those bacterial scientists invent three new test tubes full of food. That'd be like us finding three more planets that we could use. What happens? 60 minutes, the first test tube's full. 61 minutes a second is full. 62 minutes, all four are full. By quadrupling the amount of food and space, we buy two extra minutes. Our home is the biosphere. It's fixed and finite. It can't grow. And we've got to learn to live within that finite world. Every scientist I've talked to agrees with me. We've already passed the 59. Okay, so yeah, every scientist is talked to. So, um, so that was your tax dollars at work, by the way. So that was produced by the National Film Board uh, a couple of years ago. So um, now you might think, okay, well, it's Suzuki. Uh, what has he been smoking, man? You know, it's been around for a while. Maybe it's uh, way out there. Uh, if I had time, I would show you uh, video clips of uh, Jane Goodall, uh, the chimp lady, if you're, uh, I guess you're familiar with her, who would say, well, you know, population growth, resource consumption is the source of all other environmental problems. Reduce population numbers and we'll be able to get by. Uh, David Attenborough, I could show you another video clip, says the exact same thing. Uh, the, a speech he gave a couple of years ago in front of the Royal Society of Arts in the UK. Uh, a recent report from the uh, Royal Society. So if you think that, you know, okay, Attenborough, Goodall, uh, Suzuki, they gave up on being scientists a long time ago. Uh, this guy was a Nobel Prize in uh, physiology or medicine slightly over a decade ago. So I'll just show you the first uh, minute and 38 seconds. And again, this is what the best brains in the UK came up with. I mean, outside of economics. So let's go with him. Paul and the Planet Working Group here at the Royal Society. It's been a very interesting time for the last 21 months. We have a group of 22 who are drawn from a wide variety of disciplines across the natural and social sciences and from a wide variety of countries in different regions of the world, developed and developing. And so I think we can say that we've had a, a broad base uh, 
body of expertise coming in. We've also certainly had some very interesting discussions. We've also uh, put out a call for submissions uh, for evidence <coughs> to, to address the, the, the project. And we have um, been on uh, workshops. We've had held workshops here in the UK. We've had workshops in the US, in Ghana, and in Turkey. But why have we been doing all this? It's because we are reaching a very critical time in the development of humanity on the Earth. It's a time which has been presaged repeatedly over the years, people saying what will happen when we run out of space. Well, the strong evidence now is that we are running out of space in the sense that we are now collectively affecting the world's climate, the, the planet as a whole, the well-being of the planet, and therefore of ourselves. And this is due to the still growing human population, not growing quite as fast as it was some years ago, but still growing, and certainly our increasing consumption. And the combination of these two is leading to the effects that we see around us. Now, you look... Okay, so again, the best brides uh, in the UK talk to a lot of uh, very smart people in the US and Ghana and all sorts of places. And they came up with this notion that too many of us, too much consumption, the planet can sustain us. Uh, some other economists here, you might uh, know about Carl Safina, another hero of the planet. Economists can feel enthused about boosting unlimited growth, but that's because they don't care about all the damage we inflict on forests, grassland, coral reefs, and all these things. So here he is uh, saving some wildlife, so he's obviously, uh, he obviously knows what he's talking about. Life improves with qualities such as health, safety, love, family, community, compassion, more stuff and profiteering. No, no, that's bad. Only uh, economist growth mania, the gr those growth maniac economists believe that, but no sensible people uh, will, obviously. So for any pie, obviously the biggest slices get cut at the least crowded table, and so the easiest and least expensive and most efficient way to get a bigger slice to everyone is to limit the number of guests. So population control, consuming less, everybody will have more resources, will be better off. Now you're obviously a sophisticated audience who've been introduced to all sorts of economic insights these last few days and for many of you for several years. You might stop and ponder for a second, well, okay, if resources are truly finite, you know, if we just have, if the planet is really a test tube and if we're nothing more than bacteria, What's the point of limiting our consumption? I mean, in the future, won't bacteria run out of food anyway, even if we reduce our consumption? Since, you know, you can call in scientists, but it's, it's not going to work, Suzuki says it. And then how can you run out of oil and have global warming at the same time? But that's another issue for another day. So, the way economists and Austrians are part of that tradition, even though, honestly, that's not, I think, their strong suit up to that point. They've said very sensible things, but nothing truly original. Maybe Walter will disagree with me later. Uh, there's this other perspective that says, not that no, there's no real limit to growth because uh, we can innovate our way around scarcity, we can develop substitute, and so we can actually create resources, which is why Bradley coined that term resource ship, which is obviously a combination of resources and entrepreneurship. And the point made by a number of authors, this is a guy who came from the German historical school, but he's pretty good on that, uh, Zimmerman, almost a century ago. Previous to the emergence of man, there was all sorts of stuff on Earth, but there were no resources. Uh, resources only exist when humans mix their labor with the stuff that is around them. Otherwise, it's just stuff. Uh, Mises, a national economy. Uh, the deposits of mineral substances should not be considered any differently than other things. If humans need more resources, they'll go get more resources. There are no finite limits to what we can do. Uh, Julian Simon, you're young. How many of you have heard of Simon? Yeah, many of you haven't. Okay, uh, I don't have time to tell you about his life today, but uh, resources are created by the always renewable resource of the human intellect. Ultimately, people don't buy resources, they buy services, and there are always new ways to do things. So there's no real limits to what we can do. Okay, so this issue has been debated for a very long time. I mean, Suzuki will not tell you that. Attenborough will not tell you that. Uh, Scanlon probably not either, but Alfred Marshall, a prominent economist a century ago, wrote that people have been debating those issues forever. Uh, God even discusses that in Genesis, you know, when he promises Abraham that his descendants will be more numerous than the stars of heaven and the sun upon the seashore. So obviously God doesn't believe in limits to growth. 
But then Confucius, Plato, Aristotle, and a bunch of other people did, including some Christian theologian, including that fellow here, Tertullian, wrote at the time where the earth population was 30 times smaller than today. We have become a burden to the earth. The fruits of nature hardly suffice to sustain us. Plague, famine, warfare, and earthquakes are remedies. So he could have contributed to that Royal Society panel and be pretty much in line with what they were saying. Now, I don't know if uh, you got the list of assigned readings that I suggested. Uh, the first guy to really articulate what I would call the depletionist vision was not Malthus, but uh, this fellow here, an Italian Jesuit, Giovanni Botero, who wrote something called On the Causes of the Greatness of Cities, in which he lays out the sort of full-fledged uh, depletionist argument. So for those of you who are Catholic or who pay attention to what our current pope is saying, uh, he's, he claims his real inspiration is uh, St. Francis of Assisi, but uh, the current pope is a Jesuit. In a way, he sort of echoes that other Jesuit from a number of centuries ago. Not much progress from one Jesuit to another, as I see things. But if you look at where intellectual debates really matter, which is the English-speaking world, no, I don't really believe that, but you've had like five uh, rounds of popular interest in uh, resourceship and depletionism over the last two centuries. Uh, so every time you have prominent people who debate each other, so Malthus came along with his uh, principle of uh, his essay on population in 1798, but what people often don't know is that he was actually reacting to people who said there are no real limits to growth. The human brain will find ways around scarcity. And the latest round occurred a few decades ago between these two fellows here, Julian Simon again, good guy, Paul Ehrlich, who's the sort of standard bearer of the biologist, population bomb, we're all doomed, uh, school of thought. So if I may summarize 200 years of debate in a few slides, I think there are a few arguments that you can identify with each camp. So among those who believe that the world is going to run out of resources, uh, they all believe that everything else being equal, a reduced population will enjoy a higher standard of living. So Carl Safina said that, but Maltus said the same thing uh, 200 years ago. He says, well, the best thing that could happen to a country really is an epidemic that comes along, wipes out 80% of the population, and then the people that are left will be better off because they will be able to focus their effort on the best agricultural land. So obviously they will have more resources. Second belief, decreasing return. So in nature, the best stuff gets skimmed first. So um, if you get raw milk, some of you are fond of that, uh, the cream will rise to the top. You'll always go for the cream first. And so over time, accessing those less accessible resources means that their price will go up. So you're not only going to run out of them at some point in time, but their price will also become more expensive along the way, a point made by uh, Jevons in the coal question in which he predicted an imminent shortage of coal uh, a century and a half ago. Then past successes in overcoming natural limits is irrelevant to present conditions. So what you will, when I will debate my colleagues, I'll often hear something like, yeah, we've been wrong for 200 years, but this time it's different. <laughs> but of course, people have been saying that for 200 years on their side of things. So this is just a quote from 1922. So the present age is totally unlike any previous age. Now we have steamships, we have electricity. So now we're really doomed. You know, Jevons was wrong, but it was a different time, not relevant to the present situation. Number four. The more people you have, the more they consume, the more you will have environmental degradation. So this is uh, from a paleontologist over a century ago. Nowhere is nature being destroyed so rapidly as in the United States. We're the most advanced economy in the world, and therefore air and water are more polluted than before. Forests are swept away. Fishes are driven from stream. Many birds are becoming instinct. Now this is 1912. Can you guess what he was blaming at the time, mostly for that? No, not DDT. That's long before that. No. Italian immigrants. He says Italians are coming to the United States, they shoot all our birds, you know, we need to keep them out of the country. So kind of channeling his inner Donald Trump, I guess, except in those days, immigrants, instead of shooting good law abiding Americans, were shooting birds. So uh, that's his son here, Henry Felfrey Osborne. Um, the fifth belief, he expressed that in a book in 1948. Decreased population and production is the only way to go. Don't believe in a technical fix or that human creativity will solve problems. That's just going to happen. So 1948, the ingenuity of men will not be able to solve the final riddle, that of gaining a subsistence from the earth, because the grand and ultimate illusion is that men could provide a substitute for the elemental workings of nature. So in summary, for 200 years, you've got one side of the debate that has argued that nature imposes absolute limits to what people can do. 
Less people means wealthier individuals, a better environment, less pollution. You need to conserve for future generations, but because you're going to run out of uh, non-renewable stuff, societies must be reorganized along uh, renewable resources. Uh, typically also they believe that profits are bad, so this is what you get when you let uh, capitalism run amok. This is a painting from what is supposed to be England in 1850, painted in 1920 by an activist who wasn't there. So uh, profits, short-term outlook, benefits only a minority, and the strong incentive is to dump as much stuff in the environment as you can because then you save on the pollution costs, at least from the firm's perspective. So it's in the interest of firms to externalize as much of their production as they can. So again, we're in a bad shape. So the moral imperative, biologists, number of other people, kill capitalism before it kills the planet. This is from the Earth Liberation Front a few years ago, but you've had the same idea for a long time. Okay, what about the other side, the resource ship side? Jean-Baptiste say, 1821, a larger population that engages in trade and the division of labor will deliver greater material abundance per capita. So C is actually writing to Malthus in person. He says, no, you're completely wrong about having fewer people because 100 people who specialize in what they do best and trade with each other will generate a lot more wealth than 100 people or even two or three people just working for themselves. So if we were to apply this argument today, you could think, okay, if there are less people, they might have access to better lands, but maybe there won't be anyone uh, around to build tractors, to come up with pesticides, you won't have plant breeders, you won't have packaging specialists. And so productivity through trade and the division of labor will be much higher on a per capita basis than when you have fewer people, but in theory, uh, better natural resources. C points out the most populous countries are in general the best supply because ultimately people are not just uh, mouths to feed, but brains to think solution and hands to work. Uh, human creativity can deliver increasing returns. So this is Friedrich Engels, and yes, that's the Friedrich Engels of uh, Marx and Engels, the Communist Manifesto, so he wrote that as a very young man. The productive power at mankind's disposal is immeasurable. The productivity of the soil can be increased ad infinitum by the application of capital, labor, and science. There is no limit to what humanity can do. And after that, his body of work all went downhill, but that's another story. <laughs> Uh, human creativity, again, can deliver increasing returns. William Petty, 1682, it's more likely that one ingenious, curious man, a man may rather be found amongst 4 million people than 400 uh, individuals. So the more people there, the more brains are out there, and perhaps one or a few brains will come up with breakthroughs that will more than make up for additional numbers. Then biological analogies are stupid. Uh, Henry George, Progress and Poverty. Both the Jayhawk and the men eat chickens, but the more Jayhawks, the fewer chickens, while the more men, the more chickens. You cannot apply insights developed in studying animal populations to human populations. We're different. Past successes are ground for optimism. So in 1940s, uh, 14, Edwin Cannon, a British economist, criticizes John Stuart Mill, who believes in decreasing return, by saying that you can never look at these issues in the short term, look at the longest data series available that is out there, and you will see progress over time, even though you might have commodity cycles or periods where the trend seems to be reversed. But in the long run, things are usually getting much better, even though there might be a few hiccups along the way. So past successes are actually a guide or a reason for being optimistic about the future. Uh, Proudhon, so again, I just don't want to cite people on our side, so another anarchist there. Um, Malthusians will always, uh, Malthusianism or uh, depletionism will always result in coercive policies. If you really believe what you're saying, there's no way out of there. And so these people will always, even though they pretend to say, well, you know, we'll just provide incentive policies, they will always end up doing bad stuff. Now, I was telling you about Engels for a reason here, and the point I want to make is that you've always had two camps that believed in resource ship. Uh, what I would call the traditional Marxist perspective and the free market perspective. So on the free market side of things, people put a lot of emphasis on the role of prices, the Marxists don't, which is why I've not described that as a general rule, but you need to understand that. Our economies have a feedback mechanism, which is called the price system, in which every time a resources seems to become scare, uh, scarce or scarcer, uh, prices send signals to the rest of the economy telling people, well, Copper supplies might be running low, so look for more of it, use it more efficiently, and develop substitutes like uh, fiber optics, for example. 
Then another thing that was widely understood in the 19th century, but that is sort of lost today, even among Austrian economists, is the fact that businesses will spontaneously internalize their externalities for good practical economic reasons. So there's a quote here from a fellow named Andrew Winter, who was a well-known writer in 1876, uh, reviews a book sponsored by, whoops, the Society of Art, which is where David Attenborough gave his talk, and points out that as competition increases, as economies become more complex, it is in the interest of business to turn their waste into valuable byproducts and find them all sorts of other new uses. Uh, this is so obvious that even Karl Marx notices it. So Marx says, well, the first way businesses uh, make more profit is by becoming bigger economies of scale. But the second way uh, by, by which they increase their profitability is by, instead of wasting stuff that they've paid for by throwing it into the environment, looking, uh, looking at it and trying to find markets for what used to be waste. So uh, a few examples here. In the 19th century, before uh, natural gas came along, people used to produce gas that they would deliver to houses by essentially uh, cooking coal and adding water steams to it. Uh, you would end up with very nasty byproducts, coal tar, you would throw it in the river, it would kill all the fish, you would bury it in the ground, it would kill all the vegetation, you would try to burn it, you would smoke the neighborhood. But the gas that came out was still valuable, that at first it was produced, and people were struggling with that stuff. But even the gas was not that great, because as one contemporary described it, you know, the gas that would be shipped into houses uh, would have an intolerably stale odor, it would be noxious when burned, it would discolor the curtains, it would tarnish metals, it would eat through the cover of books, and it would cover everything with its fuming smoke. So hello, I'm here to tell you about our great new product called gas. But what happened over time? Well, all these things were scrubbed out and <coughs> coal gas manufacture became the foundation of our modern uh, synthetic world. And so all these externalities, all this pollution was actually turned into a wide array of useful stuff. Uh, slag, so whenever you want to produce, let's say, iron or steel or copper or something, um, the valuable stuff is always mixed up with a lot of dirt, so you try to extract the valuable stuff, then you're left with piles and piles of dirt. And that's a problem in the middle of the 19th century in England because uh, some chunks of the countryside become known as the black country. Why? Because they're dumping all that slag near uh, steelworks. And so in those days, uh, steelworks would employ just as many people to dump the stuff as they would have producing steel. And they would need to buy the properties around them and cart the stuff. And everybody realizes that this is obviously a waste of resources. So what will you do with that? Well, building blocks, building sand, cement, low-quality glass, mineral wool, and later on, fertilizer. And the, pro and the thing that really solves the problem, road asphalt. So if you see those old houses and you think, well, this kind of looks like fake stone, they're often made uh, with slag. Petroleum was the same at first. The only fraction, once you let uh, petroleum rest, it's like an oil, you know, so lighter stuff goes on top, middle, bottom. At first, refiners were only interested in the middle fraction, which is kerosene as a substitute for whale oil. Today it's used as jet fuel. But things like gasoline and uh, a basis for asphalt um, were thrown away, but in times nothing was wasted, all this was created into, was turned into valuable stuff. So pollution was turned into something productive. Both the economy and the environment benefited. Okay, so we've had this debate for 200 years. Who won? Well, obviously you're here, so you know. So there's more of us, we're healthier, wealthier than ever. And there's just not a little more of us, there's like a lot, lot more of us today. So we're over 7 billion people now. Uh, 2,000 years ago, there were only 200 million people. So when, again, Tertullian was complaining, there were 200 million people on Earth. Not only that, we're a lot wealthier than we used to be. So there's roughly today 50 times more wealth in the world than there was 200 years ago. And again, we could argue, but just bear with me here. So what did the depletionists forecast? Well, obviously, that we would have less and less stuff available and that we would reach a peak of production in, you know, 1972, 1991. They keep moving the date, so this is one here from 2011. And this is what oil and gas production should have looked like. We should have less and less of it. Some inconvenient facts. Well, depletionists have been wrong for 200 years. Uh, the bet is uh, when Julian Simon, the fellow that I mentioned earlier, <coughs> told Paul Ehrlich, 
a population bomber, put up or shut up, you know, put your money where your mouth is, which is something that academics never do, which is a really bad thing, by the way. No skin in the game, as we say nowadays. So Ehrlich said, okay, I'll choose five resources over a period of 10 years. If they become scarcer, their price will go up. I'll pay you the difference between what I've nominally paid for them. If their price goes down, I'll send a check to Simon. And so it happened that between 1980 and 1990, so the, the beginning and the end of the bet, the world population grew by 800 million people. Um, a lot more wealth was created. And the price of the commodities selected by Ehrlich all went down from 3% for nickel to 72% for tin. And so Ehrlich had to uh, mail a check to uh, Simon, which uh, Simon never cashed. He kept it uh, in his office displayed, which is why we know actually what bank Ehrlich used to use. And some people have said, well, Simon just got lucky. But again, remember what that fellow came and said before, look at the longest time series you have. And yes, there might be a few wake-ups, but in the long run, uh, the resource ship people won fair and square. Now, if you don't know about Paul Ehrlich, he's a jerk, which is never uh, held against academics who have the right opinion. So he's famous for saying about other, other things. The one thing the earth will never run out is imbeciles, which would include most of, uh, most of us, I would suspect. OK, so what about oil reserves? What has happened? OK, an oil reserve is the amount of oil that we know is in the ground that can be recovered at current prices. So that's the amount of oil that was recovered at uh, then prices in 1994. So that's the absolute amount. Then more people burn more oil than ever before. What are the oil reserves in 2004? More than before. Then another 10 year, more people burn more oil than ever before. This is the state of the world reserves today. There are actually a lot more reserves uh, today of a supposedly non-renewable resource than there was a couple of decades ago. Uh, so yes, people are consuming a lot more oil than before. That's world consumption between 1984, 1989 and 2014. But look, we keep going up. We keep producing more and more and more. So just to make sure that you understand, these are older data, but I just want to make sure you get the point. These were the world oil resources in 1944. So between 1944 and 2003, 18 times that amount of oil was burned. And yet in 2003, there was 20 time, 25 times more oil available as economically recoverable reserves than in 1944. You all get the point? Yeah, you're a smart audience. So uh, apparently North Dakota didn't get the memo about peak oil and depletion. So this is oil production in North Dakota in the last few years. Uh, Texas also didn't get the memo. So you could see it was going on for, it was going down for a while and now they're really going up. So yeah, they, they sort of peaked a number of years before that and then now they produce more than ever before. Uh, it's not only that we have more theoretically uh, non-renewable resources, but pollution too is going down. So if you looked at uh, here, the main indicators of air pollution in the last few centuries, it's been going down since roughly 1900 for a number of reasons. So the environment's benefited paradoxically with the expansions of fossil fuels. So this is a cartoon I love so much, I have it on my office door. So this was in 1861. So basically you've got uh, sperm whales here, which produce the best, uh, most valuable whale oil, celebrating the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania. So even in 1861, people understood that. This is the evolution of the forest cover in the United States in the last few centuries. So 1620, 95% of the natives are dead. The dark surfaces here is the extent of the forest cover. Uh, so people at first stay along rivers and the coastline, so there are less forests as people settle inland. The low point of the US forest cover is reached around 1920. And then the population is multiplied by something like four or five cars, fossil fuels. That's roughly the extent of the forest cover in the United States today. So you might think, you see the same things in Europe. So these are more recent maps. I have little videos that I would show you if I had the time. But there are a lot more trees today in the United Kingdom and the Netherlands than was the case a century ago. Uh, the same for France, Spain, Italy. Uh, these countries are a lot greener than they were back then. So what happens? Well, there we say that CO2 is also is plant food. So we might burn stuff and emit CO2, but plants are not complaining. Uh, substitute products, well, fossil fuels have replaced, uh, we've replaced a lot of stuff that was produced on the surface of the earth by stuff that comes from underneath it. And we produce a lot more food on a lot less land. We use forests a lot more effectively and we use wood products much more effectively. So 
Horses, just feeding them, required about a quarter of agricultural land in the United States a century ago. Henry Ford liberated all of that. Substitute products. Today, we produce roughly eight times more corn on a piece of land than was the case uh, a century ago. And as one of my colleagues like to put it, we now live uh, in houses made out of glue rather than out of wood, but we can build a lot more houses using the same amount of wood. And of course, uh, you get the idea that the device that you're holding in your hand and doing something interesting rather than listening to me is actually saving a lot of resources. Okay, so how do you try to tell someone like that that things are actually improving? I don't know, I've been trying for years. <laughs> So what happened? Did people like Suzuki celebrate when, they, when all that data was made available? Well, of course not. They look at the, the one thing that keeps going up is CO2 emissions. You can't uh, consume more energy uh, the way with current technology is without increasing CO2 emissions. 25 years ago, plant scientists were happy with that. They said more plant food, a warmer climate. What's not to like about that? And plant scientists had to be bring back into the fold that, no, no, we're all doomed. But there's a reason why there's so much emphasis on CO2 today. That's the only thing we produce that could sort of be viewed as increasing and being somewhat problematic, but I'm not going to go there. And then someone at UBC and his student came up with something called the ecological footprint. Are you familiar with this? Okay, so if you're not, uh, that's the thing you hear, you know, every year around Earth Day you hear, well, if everybody was living like an American, we would need four more planets. And that's because they base their analysis or those, those numbers on so-called uh, footprint analysis. The idea, and it's built into the model, is that if you consume more, you pollute more. You don't look at actual data of stuff. You just build that into your model. And so now, apparently, we're using 156% of the Earth's bio capacity. So how can you reconcile that with the numbers that I just gave you? Well, that's because the ecological footprint is really an energy footprint. So this is a little bit dated, but you look at all these elements, your cropland, grazing land, fisheries, there were less than two times the amount of world population in 1981 than there is today. But you can see that humanity, because we've become better at handling resources, we're not really increasing our consumptions of basing resources. We don't have much more of an impact on there. So how do the ecological footprint people get that result that we would need three more planets? It's because they assume that humanity should have no impact whatsoever. And that in order to do that, we would need trees to absorb all the CO2 that we emit. So when they say if everybody was living like an American, we would need three or four more planets, what they're telling you is that we would need three or four more forested planets to absorb all the CO2 that we're producing. They're not saying that the water is becoming more polluted. They're not saying that we're running out of resources. They're not saying that we're consuming too much. They're saying we need three or four more forested planets. That's all the ecological footprint tells you, but obviously that's not the way it's peddled every Earth Day. Uh, I don't know how many of you have followed that, but uh, this was from the Washington Post. Planet Earth is, yeah, is actually getting greener, but that might not be a good thing. Why? Because, well, you know, all that snowpack in the north will melt, and so, you know, when you turn from something white to something dark like a forest, you actually attract more solar energy, and so it will just accelerate global warming. So the planet getting greener is actually a problem now. I'm just saying, it's, it was in nature climate change not too long ago. Okay, so why is it that people like Suzuki and my colleagues can never be happy? Uh, I have a number of hypotheses. I don't have time to go over them. I mean, a lot of them are not bad people, uh, but of course, some of them like their guru status, and they're not going to say, well, I've been wrong for 50 years, sorry. So how do you, uh, how do you convey these ideas? Well, I've tried to reframe the narrative and give me five more minutes, uh, four, four minutes, okay? Uh, Okay, 10 minutes, okay. So, you know, I'm trying to promote this radical idea that humans, that, that bacteria are not, good are not good analogies to humans, and that the earth is not a tube of beer or whatever it was that Suzuki was feeding his bacteria. So humans are part of nature, but we've evolved beyond those other species. We have a few killer apps. First, our big brain, which made us able to develop technologies, and then we trade. So you know all of that, but if you can give me insights here, I would appreciate them. So these are brains that are up to, uh, to scale here. So that's a human brain, and that's a chimpanzee brain. So our brain is three times larger than a chimpanzee. That should count for something. So that's the ultimate resources, I would argue. 
Now, of course, many animals use tools, but they're called opportunity tools. You know, they will pick up a stick, um, a stone, whatever, a sponge. Whoops, sorry. And so these are the kind of tools that other animals use. But because of our big brains, uh, humans were able to develop the capacity to combine existing stuff in new ways to create new things. So every new innovation is a combination of existing things. So these are prehistoric tools, but humans have been doing that for a very long time. And so as a result of that, cultural evolution, or the world that humans create, can evolve a lot faster than the, ty the type of time scale that biologists are used to. So the Watt engine, for example, was developed to pump water out of mines, but it was quickly applied to cotton mills, locomotive, boats. Think of any synthetic material, can have a wide variety of uses. Uh, out of the mines came mine carts and steam engines. You combine the two, what do you get? You get a locomotive. You know, we can create new stuff all the time. Uh, for an assembly line, actually, was an application of the disassembly line in meat packing. So you would bring in a pig and cut it apart. Some of Ford engineers saw that and say, why don't we reverse the process? You know, we keep combining things in new ways. Uh, fracking was a combination of existing things. So Fritz Maclop, a student of Mises, Every new invention furnishes a new idea for potential combination with vast number of existing ideas. The number of possible combination increases geometrically with the number of elements at ends. The more ideas we have, the more ideas we can generate. So this notion that we're going to run out of ideas to solve our problems is ludicrous, just because of what invention is all about. Then trading in physical goods. So the propensity to truck barter and exchange one thing for another is unique to human beings. So animals will trade services, let's say grooming for protection, but humans are the only species that trade physical good. Out of this comes the division of labor and all the productivity that I was telling you about before. So again, we're part of nature, but we've evolved beyond that. We've added new things. Besides, renewable poverty is not sustainable. So these are Dutch whalers going north of Norway and collecting whatever resources they can. I mean, those polar bears don't look very threatening. I suspect that the painter actually wasn't there, but <laughs> you see here, uh, no Greenpeace. No Greenpeace activists here trying to stop the Dutch whalers. Why? Because people needed whale oil. But the point, the point that surprisingly Attenborough even doesn't get is that the poorer people are, the less efficient they are, the more land and resources they actually need to use to deliver mediocre results. So shifting agriculture is obviously not very productive, but you're poor, you don't have tractors, you don't have fertilizers, what do you do? Well, you've got a patch of land, grow something, move on, then move on, cut, move on. But this is what Europe used to be all about until about a century and a half ago. So Plato was complaining about that. Uh, again, look at how happy that little girl in Finland looks like. See here? So that's the last uh, peacetime famine in Europe, in Finland, late 19th century. So these people have had to revert back to uh, subsistence farming. Uh, there, weren't many, there weren't actually many trees in the Black Forest two centuries ago. That's because, again, people were burning the landscape, trying to grow stuff, then move on. Um, this is a map that was produced in Germany a century ago that tried to anticipate, that tries to describe what Europe was like a century before. So the dark areas are forested. That would be uh, Denmark, uh, Germany, a thousand years ago, sorry. Why are they doing that? Well, that's because that's the amount of forest left in Europe in 1900. And they say, well, you know, if, if the trend continues, we're in big trouble. And so this is what environmentalists were worried about a century ago. There's a book called The Rape of the Earth, which basically says, you know, uh, actually, we need white people the world over because you let the natives do their own things and they will ruin things. So this is why colonial uh, rulers are needed. So, you know, this, this was Africa, obviously, India. So white people need to step in. Uh, 1948, uh, Voigt was actually the sort of intellectual mentor of Ehrlich. Uh, we're destroying the earth. That's really bad. So it's not because you're poor and you don't have many technologies that you won't have a huge environmental impact. Actually, you will. Then another common mistake of biologists is that they don't go high enough in terms of looking at the landscape. So you might look at this and say, well, this is terrible. You know, all this suburbia, the cars, that's evil. Yeah, but again, remember, this is America's without car. And this is America with cars. So yes, there are many more of us than before, but we live mostly concentrated in cities. Uh, Hispaniola, so you've got Haiti on the one side, the Dominican Republic on the other, so guess where the border is here? Poor people relying on renewable resources, richer people using propane, just saying. 
uh, poverty and pollution, so you had lecture on Eastern Europe. The fascinating thing about Eastern Europe is that they became poorer and more polluting over time as opposed to market economies, but now you know all about that. And so the key point is that it's not how many people there are or how wealthy you are, it's how you use resources. And the more you're efficient in the way you handle resources, the less impact you'll have on the environment, even if there are more of you and you consume more. I'm done. So that spoke David to the bacteria. I'm sorry, I don't want to pick on him, but you know, depopulate, worship limits, and renewables. What I would argue, three popular proposition, and I'm done. A clean environment is not a function of population numbers and wealth, but of technologies and institution. Stagnation and degrowth is actually incompatible with sustainable development because fewer, poorer, less technologically developed people will actually have more of an impact on the land paradoxically. And markets are not the laws of the jungle because for no other reason that there's no physical trade among other species, but they're actually extremely good for flora and fauna. And with this, I'm done. <laughs> One question, I guess. Oh, I'll keep them for later. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Thank you for being such good guinea pigs. Forget it. I don't want to bet because he knew we'd lose again. And one other thing, they actually did continue. Uh, some people about 10 years ago actually looked at that bet again. I think like 10, 15 years afterwards, and it continued to be that uh, even though you know even more people, more resources being used, yeah. everything had gone down in price. Yeah. Well, uh, Professor De Rocher did have that uh, on one of his diagrams. Okay, I'm about ready to start, and my topic uh, will overlap a little bit with Professor de Roche, uh, but not much, uh, uh, mainly the pollution part. There will be some overlap there. And what I'm about is market failure. And within the profession of economics, there's market failure, market failure, market failure. One summer, I didn't really have much to write about, so I got a whole bunch of American Economic Review articles, and either they were hyper-mathematical, which I didn't really understand because I'm not into that stuff, or they were talking about market failure. I mean, if you want to get a, a, an article in the American Economic Review, just come up with a new market failure, of which there are many, 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 and they'll probably publish you. But as an Austrian economist, I don't think there is any market failure in the sense that the economics profession means market failure. Now, there's another sense in which, of course, there's market failure because markets are comprised of people like us, uh, human beings that are uh, you know, fallible and we make mistakes. So yes, there's market failure in that sense, but that's not what the economists mean by market failure. What they mean by market failure is something where the government theoretically improve things. Now, I did uh, devote one of my lectures previously, the monopoly and antitrust, to a market failure, namely there's a market failure of large size. And I hope I knock that one out of the park, or at least uh, put a pinprick in that balloon. And today I'm going to deal with two other market failures. Uh, one is externalities, and the other is public goods. These are uh, the big three, monopoly, externalities, and public goods, as I see it, market failure. So if we want to uphold the veracity of markets, and as Austrian economists, uh, that, that's where we're at, we have to squelch these market failures, show why they're uh, problematic. Okay, so the first one I'm going to do is um, uh, externalities. And externalities are situations where uh, the two people who are interacting affect third parties, either positively, as in positive externalities or external economies, or negatively, as in negative externalities or uh, external diseconomies. Th that would be uh, synonyms uh, for uh, these externalities. So let me take the first one over here. And I have to stay here in order to be heard, so I wrote everything uh, there as opposed to writing it as I go. Well, probably a better idea to go this way. So here is the external economy. And the usual example there is education. And we have a supply and demand curve before the D prime comes in. 
And the supply and demand curve are supply is usually costs. That, that's behind the supply curve, at least in um, uh, neoclassical economics. And this is a neoclassical uh, motif, so I'm, I'm using the neoclassical uh, instrumentality. And the demand curve is a benefit. And there's no real dispute over the costs, they're upward sloping, but there is a problem about the benefits because what they mean by that demand curve is private benefits of education. So what are the private benefits of education? Well, you get a better job, you'll meet a better spouse, you'll make better friends, you'll uh, be a nicer person, you'll be more interesting, whatever. Uh, namely, all the benefits that accrue to you, that's the demand curve. But the argument is that not only are there private uh, benefits that accrue to you, the person who is uh, buying education, being a student, but there are also spillover benefits or external benefits where you benefit other people. For example, you're less likely to be a criminal, you're more likely to vote better, you're more likely to be a good neighbor to other people. But you don't take that into account, you dirty rats, you. You only look at your own personal benefits because you're a bunch of capitalist piggies, oink oink, and you don't really give a rap about uh, other people. So. Uh, what we have to do is draw another demand curve, uh, which is to the right of that demand curve, because now we're adding demand curves, and the distance between the two demand curves is the external benefits to other people, and now we get a, a D prime, which shows the real full benefits, namely the private and the public benefits, and we notice that the actual amount of education that is being purchased is uh, where I put a, uh, actual, where the supply and demand meet, and the optimal amount of uh, uh, education is where I put optimal, namely where the supply curve hits not the demand curve, but the D prime. And the uh, optimal amount is greater than the actual amount, yes? Is it clear from the diagram? So, uh, according to Milton Friedman and other pinkos like that, what we have to do is subsidize education, whether with a voucher plan or just give money to people or um, uh, uh, Obama now wants to make uh, education, no, that's Bernie Sanders, he wants to make education free for everybody up to college. Uh, namely, we've got to move to the right because that's where the optimal point is. So that's the main argument. What are the criticisms of it? Well, one criticism is you never know these external benefits. How do we know that they're external benefits? Uh, we can't measure them. It's just lines on a board. Uh, these uh, mainstream economists are very fond of lines on the board. You don't really know that th there are these benefits. And there's reason to believe uh, that maybe it's uh, not such a great benefit. Because um, let's stipulate that rent control and minimum wage laws are uh, very harmful to everybody except a few um, uh, crony capitalist types. Where is rent control and minimum wage the most popular? In the People's Republic of Cambridge, in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor, in the People's Republic of San Francisco. And what do you find in Ann Arbor, uh, Cambridge, Mass, and uh, San Francisco? Rich white No, a lot of universities. A lot of universities. So I can make a case that uh, education is miseducating people. They're, I mean, most people don't major in Austrian economics or even economics. They major in uh, sociology or uh, feminist studies or black studies or queer studies or uh, other Martian studies. I don't know what, what kind of studies they've got, multicultural studies. And what they do there is they decrease the amount of knowledge. <laughs> so maybe what we ought to do is tax education, not <laughs> subsidize it. And you can't prove it based on that. I mean, I can make a good case that what they're doing in most schools is uh, really abominable, you know, with this multiculturalism and, and the uh, uh, microaggression and, and all, you know, white males are evil and if you have a penis, you're a rapist, you know, all that stuff. Every person with a penis is a rapist. What, do you doubt that? What's the matter with you people? <laughs> so anyway, so much for external economies. Now let's talk about external diseconomies, or negative externalities. And here, uh, the, the example is in the lower right uh, blackboard. Uh, and again, you have a supply and demand curve. And uh, the supply and demand curve indicate private benefits and private costs. So now I'm gonna talk more about the supply curve, not the demand curve, because it's the supply curve that's shifting. And namely, they don't like S, they like S prime. So what is S? What are the costs of, say, producing these credences. Well, there's labor cost, 
Uh, you've got to buy the wood. You've got to uh, pay rent for uh, something. You have to pay insurance. You have to maybe buy a factory. You have to buy machines that cut the wood. Uh, a whole bunch of private costs like that. Those are the private costs. And uh, we already have laws about that. If you don't pay the guy that delivers the wood, you don't get the wood. And you go to jail for stealing wood. If you don't pay your workers, uh, uh, they get uppity and uh, you know, you're in jail for not paying workers because you promised to pay them or you had a contract to pay them and they worked and uh, you didn't pay them. So these are all private costs. And what we are, again, is with the Where with the, uh, what do you call it, the um, uh, actual. That's, what, that's the actual amount of production that we're doing here. But uh, according to these people, uh, we're not taking into account the external costs. And what are the external costs? Well, when I make this uh, credenza, what I do is I put uh, pollution up into the air, and I put uh, pollution into the water, and I make everything very bad. And when we take that into account, what we should do is either uh, tax this, or uh, COS has got various ways of uh, uh, getting uh, rid of it, and I'll talk about COS in a minute. Namely, what we have to go is from the actual to the optimal, and the optimal is fewer of these, namely less quantity. So we could tax it, we could regulate it, uh, we could do all sorts of things. But the problem is that we have pollution, which is an external cost, and this is a market failure. Okay, now let me, uh, I think so far what I've done is accurately assess what they're about in both cases. And now let me, as I criticize this one, let me try to criticize the idea of negative externalities. What's going on here? Let me tell you a little story. Once upon a time, you always have to start stories like that, in a faraway land, there was this little old lady who was, um, hanging out wash, uh, hanging out her laundry on the clothesline. This was in the oh, 1830s, 1840s. And she hung it up, and it was clean and wet. She came back two hours later, and it was dry and dirty. And what she said is, that their factory polluted my laundry, and I want uh, an injunction, which means a, a ruling from the court to get them to stop it, and I want damages, and I want them to pay me for my dirty laundry, which is their fault. Or another case is the farmer with a bunch of haystacks, and uh, uh, the haystacks got, uh, and a railroad came along, and the railroad was 500 feet away, but it had sparks that go 500 feet away, and it uh, put his haystacks on fire. And in the 1830s and 1840s, uh, you, the environmental plaintiff went to court, and not always won, but uh, won sometimes because this was uh, to get into libertarianism. This was a property rights issue, and uh, pollution, air pollution, or sparks, or noise, or whatever it is in the case of an airport, uh, is a trespass. Uh, they violated the property rights of the little old lady with her clothing on the line, or the former. And uh, the benefit of this was several. Uh, one, you had a little bit of environmental forensics. You know, we know what forensics is from all those cop shows. You know, if there's somebody uh, dead, you look at the hair follicles, the semen, uh, uh, in case of penetration, uh, the blood, wh whatever, and you try to find out who, who done it. Well, environmental forensics is here we have a bit of dust on the little old lady's uh, uh, laundry, and now we've got to go look at which factory did it, and whichever factory did it, we're going to get damages out of them and an injunction out of them. So that was one benefit. Another benefit is the uh, invisible hand moved us from cheap, dirty burning sulfur coal to more expensive, cleaner burning anthracite coal. Why is this beneficial? And why would they do it? Why would manufacturers do it? Because they knew if they didn't do it, they'd have little old ladies on their uh, case, and there'd be injunctions and damages and be a pain in the neck. So you move uh, toward less uh, intensive uh, pollutant technologies toward, uh, toward, toward less pollution intensive technologies and away from heavier uh, uh, pollution intensive um, technologies. And also, uh, the railroad would put a little smoke catcher on, or a, a, a spark catcher on its, uh, on its railroad so that the, the, the sparks didn't go 500 feet, but they kept them there. And then in the chimneys, they would put like meshes in, in the chimney to sort of catch the stuff so it doesn't go. So 
Were things working perfectly? No, but you know, uh, it was working rationally. We were having a green type of situation. I mean, it was the eight, middle of the 19th century, it wasn't perfect, but the law was attuned to propriety. Uh, the law was attuned to non-market failure because all of these problems were being addressed, however imperfectly they were being addressed. Then came the progressive period. Progressive period in history in the US, and I'm not familiar with other countries, uh, 1890 to 1910, somewhere in there, maybe 1880 to 1920. And in the progressive period, the U.S. wanted to become number one. Who was number one in 1890? Great Britain. How do you get to be number one? You have battleships, you have tanks, you have uh, steel, you have uh, heavy industry. And now an entire different um, ethos or a different philosophy overcame the judges in the United States. And next time the little old lady, the farmer, came into to court, they said, yeah, yeah, they're violating your private property rights. Your stinking, lousy, selfish private property rights. There's something more important than your stinking, selfish, lousy property rights, and that's the public good. And you have to have a drum roll, public good. You know, that's great. And what does the public good consist of? Well, not letting little old ladies run roughshod over factories or farmers running roughshod over heavy industry like railroads, but uh, you know, telling them, you know, take a hike. You, you, we're not going to do anything for you. No injunction from us. No damages from us. Uh, too bad. Although they did offer them a SOP. And the SOP was they had minimum smokestack height regulations. Before, the smokestack was, you know, 10, 20 feet high. Now the smokestack had to be 200 feet high. And when the, there were smokestacks were 10 feet high, it was easy to figure out who, or easier to figure out where the smoke came from. When they're 200 feet high, it's much harder to find out, but we don't have to find out. Uh, Murray Rothbard wrote the, the best uh, piece on environmental economics. Um, something, uh, the title is Air Pollution. I forget the, the full title of it. If you're interested, email me it. Uh, if you can't find it by Googling it, email me it, and I'll uh, email me and I'll send it to you. A magnificent article. He quotes some court in uh, 1919 where somebody sued somebody, and, and the court said, "Well, this is not actionable. Namely, trespass is not actionable. So how is that government failure? That's market failure." And then what happened in uh, 1950, 1960, all of a sudden we realized we're living uh, up to our armpits in pollution and we got to use uh, uh, masks and stuff. Uh, and then they had the Clean Air Act to solve the problem of the market. But it wasn't the market's problem. It was the, the fault of government, which is supposedly to protect private property rights, which they sort of did in the mid-19th century. But at the turn of the, the last century, they stopped. So of course, uh, you're not going to have environmental uh, sense. You're not going to have any employer being in a green employer and putting in a, 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 a smoke prevention device which costs money. You're not going to find any of them using uh, anthracite coal. They'll all go back to sulfur coal. Because if you were a green businessman and you used uh, uh, more expensive anthracite coal, what would happen to you? You go broke because all the other guys are using cheaper technologies. So it, the invisible hand sort of is choking us because the law undergirds the economy. And if the law isn't right, namely protecting private property rights, well, then the whole thing goes kablooey. OK, so much for externalities. Now what I want to do is a little Coase. And uh, uh, Ronald Coase won a Nobel Prize, a very famous guy. He uh, Not only did he win a Nobel Prize, but uh, one of the things that people um, really like or, or, gives prestige is not so many how many articles you have in, in uh, top journals, but rather citations. How many citations? And this article of Coase was the most heavily cited article of any article uh, that has ever been written. And economists have fallen for this nonsense. So I'm a bitter opponent of Coase. Uh, last year, I had a debate with uh, uh, Professor Fox over this. And um, see, he's left, so that shows I'm, I'm right. <laughs> Kidding. Okay, so one of the things uh, is this Sturgis versus Bridgman, and I forget who was the doctor and who was the machinist, and I put numbers up there uh, th that indicates time. So uh, the first thing that happened, and these are two contiguous buildings with a, a common wall between them, and the first thing that happens is that the machinist puts in a machine way away from the doctor. So all is well and there's no problem because the noise from the machine and the doctor needs quiet so he can hear his stethoscope. 
Then what happens is number two, the doctor puts his office at that end of his house, and again, all is well because the noise doesn't reach. And then the third thing that happens is that the machinist moves. He moves his machine from place one to place three, and now there's a problem because the doctor sues the machinist for, uh, what do you call it, a noise pollution, which is a form of pollution, and uh, the, the machinist says, well, you know, um, I have a right to do this, and, and how are we going to settle this? Well, the way the libertarian would settle this is based on homesteading, and homesteading is based on who was there first, and who was there first uh, in this case was the doctor, because uh, we don't count the fact that the machinist was way over at the other end of his office. We count the fact that the doctor was there first, namely in second place, and then in third place uh, the, the guy moved his machine. So it's clear that the uh, libertarian analysis of this would be uh, we would uphold the, um, the doctor. He was there first, or in, second is uh, closer in time than third. How does Coase answer this? The way Coase answers this uh, this pollution problem is very, very horrendous, if I can put a word on that. What Coe says is, let's figure out the total cost. How much would it cost the doctor to uh, move his office back? How much would it cost the machinist to move his machine back to where it was? And whichever is cheapest, we'll find in his case. If it's cheap for the machinist to move his machine back where it was, fine for the doctor. If the machine is very heavy and the doctor could more easily move his um, uh, office to the other end of his house, well then we'll find for the machinist. The problem with that is uh, right now Redmond has a wallet in his pocket and I claim ownership of it. And if there's a Kosian judge, what I'm going to say is, well, if I get the contents of that wallet, I'll create great uh, Austrian economics, great libertarian theory, whereas uh, Redmond is a bum, and we know what he's going to do with his money. He's going to go out and get drunk tonight, as he does every night, and, and therefore uh, GDP will be higher if I get the wallet that's now in his pocket. And the Kosian judge would support me because what, the, what Kos is all about is maximizing GDP and he doesn't care a rap about interpersonal comparison utility or anything like that. He just thinks that, you know, let's say I'm, I'm right. Well, then I get his wallet. Uh, the, the point is that if I can get his wallet and it's, his wallet's got his wife's picture, he's got his kid's picture, he's got all sorts of evidence that he owns it, but that's just historical. I mean, for the Austrian, or rather for the libertarian, that would be definitive. It's his wallet. He's got evidence that it's his wallet. He's got a bill of sale. Uh, the judge asked me, well, do you have a bill of sale for his wallet? I said, no, I just like his wallet. He's got money in it, and you know, I want the money. So what Coase is really about is undermining all property rights because anyone can claim anything else that they want. And I admit this is a reductio ad absurdum, but I'm sort of into reductios ad absurdum, and this is, is one of them. And I, I've got a whole bunch of articles attacking Coase for this, and the criticism is, well, Coase never said that. Well, Coase never said that I could get uh, Redmond's wallet. But Coase did say that the way to settle this, or the, the way to settle the problem of if there are cows uh, trespassing on the cornfields, who should pay? Well, for the libertarian, uh, the, the cow has to pay. The cow guy has to put the fence to prevent his cows from uh, poach, poaching on, on the corn. Whereas the Kosian guy would say, well, it depends, upon, it depends upon the relative prices of corn and meat. But the relative price of corn and meat keep changing. So one day it's OK for the cows to go there, and the next day it's not. This is chaos, not anarchy, chaos. This is chaos. OK, the third thing I want to get into now is uh, maybe the granddaddy of all of these um, uh, market failures, uh, and that's a thing called public goods. And what's a public good? A public good is something that the market can't provide. And if the market can't provide and we want it, well, that's a market failure because only the government can provide it. Now, uh, I have uh, made a career out of <laughs> saying there ain't no such thing as something that the market can't provide. One of my books was on privatizing roads. Uh, the book that I'm now coming out with is Oceans, Rivers, and Lakes. Uh, and then the one I'm now working on is uh, privatizing the moon, the Mars, and, and other uh, uh, foreign uh, bodies, heavenly bodies. So I don't think there's anything that can't be run privately better than government. But the mainstream of economists, even the most right-wing free market economists, would buy into all of this stuff, and, and they're all wrong. I mean, Milton Friedman on this uh, voucher thing is considered a right-wing free enterprise economist, but he buys into this stuff. He buys into all of this stuff. 
Okay, so what's going on with regard to um, public goods? Uh, the way I have to introduce this is first I have to explain what excludability is and then I have to explain what rivallessness is and figure out why things are in the boxes that they're in. Have you had this in, in your courses? Raise your hand. Okay, about half. So this would be a good review uh, because sometimes it's good to hear stuff even though you know stuff because I'll say it with a different body English and maybe a different joke or something and uh, uh, maybe you'll get it better. Not that I'm saying it better than your teachers, but uh, it's good to hear from someone else the same sort of stuff. And professors in the group maybe can learn a different way of presenting this than, than otherwise. Okay, so excludability means can you exclude non-payers? Can you exclude a person who isn't paying? And the idea here is you can't exclude people from a busy street because, I mean, think of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Times Square in New York City on, on New Year's Eve or something. <laughs> there are millions of people there. And how are you going to check uh, who has a right to be there? Uh, by the way, the way we check here whether you have a right to be here is we have those things, which I, I lost. Could you wave yours around, David? You're supposed to have these, and that is a way of excluding people who didn't pay or who weren't invited or whatever. I suppose I should be kicked out because I lost mine, but that's a whole other story. It's a small group, so I think we, we know each other. Uh, also, I, I do uh, uh, race walking. I go anywhere from 5K to half marathon. I'm going to do my first marathon one of these days. And the way they do it there is you have a little placard on your shirt. And if you don't have that, the cops will take you out of the race and say you're stealing services. So I think we can exclude people from a busy street by just giving them a little placard. And now we can do it electronically. If, you're not on, if you don't have that, you can, you can be evicted. Okay, the lighthouse is another one. And here, Coase is horrible. Coase wrote this thing about the lighthouse, and um, he said, well, you can't exclude people from benefiting from the lighthouse. Therefore, the lighthouse has to be a public good because the light uh, put on a rock or something to make sure that the ships, and this is uh, during sailing ship days uh, and before the radar and, and sonar and, and stuff like that where ships can keep off of rocks they want. And the point is that um, I want to defend the market uh, not only today but forever, uh, back in history. So I, I want to attack this idea. And uh, the idea here is, well, if you have a lighthouse, how are you going to exclude non-payers? because they're out there in, in the harbor or wherever they are and you can't uh, exclude them. Okay, so that's excludability. Can you exclude non-payers? Okay, now what's rivalrousness? Rivalrousness is, are these things rival? Namely, if, if I have it, can you have it too? If you have it, can I also have it? In which case it's not rivalrous. On the other hand, if it's, um, um, uh, if I have it, you can't have it, well then that's rivalrous. So a hot dog is rivalrous. So I'm eating a hot dog, you can't have that hot dog. I'm wearing this shirt, this shirt is ri uh, partakes of rivalrousness. So I'm wearing it, you can't wear it at the same time. On the other hand, radio and TV is not rivalrous. Because if I'm listening to the radio and now you turn on the radio, or I'm watching TV and you turn on the TV, do you, uh, diminish my use of the TV? No. So radio and TV are non-rivalrous. Okay, so everyone clear on what excludability is and what rivalrousness is. Okay, so now we put them together and we say that the hot dog is, yes, you can exclude. The hot dog vendor has a very credible threat over you that if you don't pay him, he's gonna call the cops. So a hot dog is uh, excludable and it's uh, rivalrous, because two people can't eat the same hot dog. Uh, so that would be a private good. And don't think th that this is 25, 25, 25, 25. It is for some people, for the Marxists, they would say, well, the only thing is the upper left-hand corner that is a private good, that is not a public good. Everything else is either a, a quasi-public good or a pure public good. The quasi-public uh, goods would be the busy street and the radio and TV because they only admit of one of them, excludability or rivalrousness, whereas the lighthouse uh, admits of both. So that's called a pure public good. The other are semi or quasi-public goods. Okay, uh, so don't think that it's 25, 25, 25. It depends upon who you're talking to. If it's the Marxist, then he's gonna probably say, yes, you can have private goods for hot dogs and that's about it. And there's 1% in there. Most right-wing economists would say, well, 80% is in the upper left-hand quadrant. So the public good problem doesn't arise from many things. 
uh, the other three boxes are, you know, 5%, 5%, and maybe 1% or something like that. Okay, uh, so the um, radio and TV are not rivalrous, but they are excludability. They, they're non-excludable, so they're a public good. And the busy street is also, it's, um, it is rivalrous because uh, when another person gets on the street, he slows down everybody else, right? So it's not that they can't both fit, but then now they're slower. So that there is a cost imposed on the one by the other in, in the sense that there is no cost when the second guy uh, starts in with the TV or the radio. And the lighthouse, there's no excludability and uh, it's not rivalrous. So from two sources, it's a public good and therefore it's a pure public good. Now, my criticism of it, I already started in with a criticism of the busy street. They just give people a placard in, in the old days or an electronic placard or something like that. And now, uh, and you impose a, a stiff fine. You say, look, anyone caught here on this public uh, private street, uh, we're going to, you know, uh, you know, I don't know what, uh, fine you $1,000. It's a very credible threat. Now, all of a sudden, it's excludable. And it's the same thing with radio and TV. We have, we have our vase. Uh, that was my German uh, Nazi accent. I don't know if it went over that well, but that was my attempt. Um, we have a ways of uh, making private radio and TV. Namely, what we do is we broadcast our radio or TV um, uh, waves, and then we jam them. And then we sell you an unjamming it, uh, device, which would make it like pay TV. So we can do that. Well, what about the lighthouse? Can the lighthouse be privatized? Can we have private lighthouses in those days of sailing ships? And the answer is, in an article or two that my colleague Bill Barnett and I wrote about, was uh, yes, uh, there is a threat. What we can say is, look at you guys who don't want to pay. Um, one of these days, not every day, but one of these days, the, the clouds are going to come in, the clouds are going to go out, and by the way, we know the silhouette of all the ships. And if there's any one of our clients out there, we'll keep the lighthouse. We'll keep the light on. But one of these days, uh, we're going to see you guys, and it's not going to be any of our clients, and we're going to shut the bloody thing off, and you guys are going to the on the shore. That's a credible threat, which means that the sailing ship captains of the non-payers, they're going to have to pay more or less to their, sea, uh, to their workers, the, the guys who are sitting on the ship uh, helping put the sails up and down. They're going to have to pay more, because now all of a sudden it's risky. So it, it, we don't have to exclude them all the time, but we can just have a credible threat that will exclude them sometime, and they're going to pay up. Now, Coase wrote this article, and I admit this is a mistake of mine, and I didn't read the whole thing. And I, I, I'm a bitter opponent of Coase on everything, so I figured, I read three quarters, but it seemed good, so I said, oh, Coase is a great guy. And my colleague Bill Barnett said, block you moron, you should read the whole thing. And when I read the whole thing, I realized that uh, Coase doesn't, Coase is a moron. Uh, you know what he, you know, he said that the, the lighthouse could be privatized, which was a big thing. You know, the Coase, a critic of the market. Well, he's supposedly a supporter of the market, but I think of him as a critic of the market. And now all of a sudden he's uh, uh, saying that the lighthouse can be privatized. But do you know what? The way he talked about how the, uh, he gave some cases in England in, I don't know, 1500 or something like that. You know, you know how they paid? The government demanded that they pay. Well, how is that free, free enterprise? I mean, Coase doesn't understand the difference between a tax and a voluntary payment. You know uh, that joke, um, uh, what is it? Do you know the difference between a bathroom and a, and a living room? If you don't, don't come to my house. <laughs> That's the joke. Well, I say, do you know the difference between a tax and a voluntary payment? And if you don't know it, don't get into political economy. Because that's the crucial difference in, in uh, political economy. Voluntary payment versus a compulsory uh, levy or a compulsory tax. And Coase is confusing those two. And, and this, this guy won the Nobel Prize. And uh, the most heavily cited article, and, and I mentioned John McGee before in uh, the uh, Journal of Law and Economics, Coase started that journal. He got some good articles in it, but Coase himself is uh, highly problematic. 
Okay, I've got about 12 minutes left and I decided not to uh, go the whole 45 minutes so we can have questions and discussion and dialogue. We'll have more. Uh, Professor Desrochers is on next and then after he speaks we'll have a panel discussion of the professors as we did the last two nights. But uh, right now we can have questions, discussion. Nothing? <laughs> Got a guy in the back. Could you speak just a little louder? Sorry, I can. You mentioned rivalrous and non rivalrous behavior. You cited, you cited radio and television as one of those examples. And then you expanded it to, to include an encoder box and a decoder box, which is that the television, sort of like paid television. So, I mean, that's sort of what the copyright battle is like today on the internet. Well, I don't see any contradiction between uh, believing that you can't own information because information, once it's out, is no longer a good because uh, uh, my, it's not rivalrous. The fact that I know E equals MC squared or that I can put my limited hair in a ponytail and now other people uh, copy me, I can still keep my ponytail and I can still keep my information. So I, I'm with Kinsella on this one, you really can't own information. But that doesn't mean that it would be illegitimate for, the, uh, for someone to try to cash in on the information. And the way to cash in on the information is I broadcast the radio or a TV show, and then I jam it, and then I sell you an unjamming device. Uh, I'm trying to... Uh, take advantage of something uh, that, um, in a sense, uh, I have no right to do in, in a limited sense, but I certainly have a right to broadcast, and I have a right to jam, and I have a right to sell you something. Look, you know, if we couldn't take advantage of information, what about the cello teacher? You go to the cello teacher, learn how to play cello, and then you say, well, I'm not going to pay you because you're just giving me information about how to play the cello. Well, the cello teacher can say, you know, get out of my house. I'm not giving you any more lessons if you're not going to pay. So just because you believe that you can't own information doesn't mean that you can't charge for it. It's, I guess it's a little bit of a, a quandary or a, a, a strange situation that you can't own it, but you can still charge for it. But you can charge for it, and you can uh, not own it. So I, I don't see a logical contradiction, although I do see some sort of... Uh, point uh, that you're making, and I think it's a very good point. Uh, Dave? Yeah, in this example that you give up here, you would, you adjudicate from the, in the doctor machinist example, you adjudicate from the libertarian position on the side of the doctor saying that she's homesteaded that position first, and so any sound that comes through is infringing on her, on her right. Is that, am I reading you correctly? There are no female doctors. <laughs> They're only male doctors. Why? Because the word he includes he and she, and it's only politically correct people that, that use he and she and she and all that stuff. So they're all males here. <laughs> but a female machinist only he's. No, oh, well, okay. <laughs> well, I'm just. Maybe I'm sexist. Yeah, you, you're a real pig. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Yeah, so don't you think, from the machinist there, don't you think that this infringes on his rights? Because he, I mean, he's got his apartment or whatever, and you're saying that he's not allowed to put his machine over there in position three? Right, he's not allowed to put his machine there in position three. Now, if the doctor had his office oh, point four over to the left, uh, and the doctor didn't object, then he could. But in homesteading, it's first on line, first served, or you know, whoever homesteads it first is the owner of it. Uh, because if the second guy uh, can be the owner of it, well then how about the sixth or the 26th doctor and uh, the 26th homesteader and then no uh, security of property <coughs> rights. Uh, no, I, I think uh, the, the idea of homesteading is the first guy there uh, gets the right. And now what we're talking about is the right to either e emit noise or not. 
And uh, when, he was, when the machinist was way over in number one, there was no problem. But when the machinist moved to position three, uh, he's now uh, interfering with the quiet of the doctor who homesteaded that quiet first. So you all, whenever there's homesteading problems, it's who owns it first. And uh, the, the doctor was in second place, and the machinist was in third place, and second beats out third. One is really irrelevant here. I could have done it just with those two things. I could have said, well, first the doctor was there, and then the machinist came along. Uh, yes, sir? I don't know if this is exactly the right question for this topic, but I think it might be close. And it's more that if, if I'm Monsanto, and I create a, uh, and I, and I create a soybean uh, seed that is going to be genetically modified in a way that's going to give me advantages to a farmer, and I sell it to a farmer, and he plants it and he grows it, but the wind blows the seed over to my lot. So now the seed is on my property. I didn't pay for it. I didn't ask for it, but it's now on my property. Um, so, I guess, what's the stance on that? Right? Well, my view on that is uh, Monsanto can only make a, a, a contract with the person to whom they sold it in the first place. And if they made a contract that you've got to keep these seeds to yourself and you've got to make sure that the wind doesn't uh, blow any of the seeds to your neighbor, well, then uh, your Monsanto can sue your neighboring farmer. But if Monsanto made a contract like that, nobody would buy it because the, the wind takes seeds, you know? So uh, it, it's the same thing with a book. I, I wrote Defending the Undefendable, and somebody saw it and copied it. Now, they can't say that they wrote it. That would be fraud. But they could say, uh, uh, here is um, a Redmond who can say, uh, uh, Defending the Undefendable by Walter Block, as brought to you by Redmond. And uh, there, there's no uh, fraud at all. Uh, because look. Because Redmond bought this book from somebody, but I didn't have a contract with that person saying, you first of all, I don't have the copyright anymore, so anyone can uh, reprint that book. Don't reprint Defending 2. Uh, there's a ah, second in the series because somebody else owns the copyright, my publisher, and he would be, not she, he <laughs> would be upset. So don't do that. So I, I think the Monsanto case is uh, pretty much, in practical terms, tough on Monsanto. They, they can't exclude. Uh, or at least they shouldn't be allowed to under libertarian law. Uh, guy in black. Um, well, I actually have two questions. I'm not really connected. Um, first of all, with the machinist and doctor, how would you be able to prove that the machinist didn't have his position in position three the whole time? Uh, well, let me answer that one first. Uh, I'm assuming the truth. Uh, it's a whole other question: is how to ferret out the truth. I'm assuming a God's eye view that these are the facts, and and the two of them don't dispute this. So, I mean, there are certain cases where the thing is given because I don't want to get sidetracked from the principle of property rights into how do we uh, determine guilt or innocence, which is a completely different issue. Now you get into this uh, where they cut the baby in half, remember that one in the Bible, as a way to find out who the real mother of the baby was. But that's an entirely different issue. It's interesting, I, I do some work with the Talmud, the Hebrew uh, the learning, and half of it is what the law should be, and half of it is how do you find out who the guilty person is. And I'm not really that interested in that. I'm much more interested in what the law should be. And I found a great overlap between libertarianism and the Talmud, strangely enough. What was your second question? My second one had to do with your um, example with the education system. What about, well, some people may argue that if you make education subject to the market, it would be more expensive because of the lack of subsidies, which could lead to um, less skilled Well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, well, what is your argument against that point, where has free, how free education actually would be better? Well, look, everything free would be better. I mean, wouldn't it be great if shirts means, were free and... I mean, in free market education. How would it be better as to subsidize education? Well, free market education is based on voluntary interaction where it's subsidized. Where do they get the money to subsidize it? With the gun. They go to people and say, you, whether you like it or not, you're going to pay for someone else's education. Suppose you have a, a, a woman of 70 with no children. And you tell her, well, you're going to pay for someone else's kid. And she said, well, I don't have any kids. I don't want to pay for it. Uh, you know, I want to spend my money on whatever. You're forcing her at the point of a gun to pay for it. Now, this is a libertarian argument. The, the argument here is, will it be more efficient if we have more education because of the spillover effects? And what I'm trying to say is uh, the, the spillover effects are just a, 
a theory or a claim, and uh, we have counter evidence about you know education being miseducation. Another question? Yes. It's probably been about fifteen years since I've read the Coast Theorem, but I actually think that you are misrepresenting what Coase said in that article. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> No matter which way you assign property rights, no matter which way the court assigned property rights, the parties would negotiate to the to the result that would maximize GDP. And I don't think he advocated for one way or the other. Now, perhaps some of his later people, perhaps some of his followers did, but I don't think that he did. Well, we have to respectfully disagree, and what you should do is write an article refuting my articles if you're into that sort of stuff, and if not, I'll just tell you why I think you're wrong. For Coase, there were two states of the world. One was the zero transactions cost, which he meant as sort of a never-never land, just theoretical to contrast the real world where transactions costs are very high. And what Coase said, as Karen was quite accurate in saying, is that in the zero transactions cost world, it doesn't matter which way the judge goes, because let's say the doctor values it more. If you give it to the doctor, he'll keep it. If you give it to the machinist, the doctor will bribe the machinist out of it because the doctor values it more. And with that, I had some slight disagreements and I got into a big, a long ha hassle with um, Harold Demsetz, another very famous economist who hasn't won a Nobel Prize yet, but when he does, I'll be famous because I kicked his butt. But uh, <laughs> one day he might win it. He's, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Nobel Abiel? You know, Pape Abiel means uh, uh, one of the cardinals could be uh, Pope in, in the next go round. Nobel Abiel means whenever they think of Nobel Prizes for economists, they think of 10 or 15 people who would be candidates. Well, Harold Demsetz is one of them. So what Coase said is that in the zero transactions cost world, uh, it wouldn't matter which way the judge goes, whoever values it more, given no transactions costs, uh, he'll buy it out. And I had some slight problems with that. It assumes that the briber has money, a very minor point. But then Coase, in the same article, you probably read the first half of the article, uh, like I did on, on the uh, Lighthouse. In the second part, he says, well, now let's assume uh, high transactions costs or infinite transaction costs, there's no bribery. Now it really matters what the, what the judge decides. And how should the judge decide? He should give it to the same guy who got it in the zero transactions cost world, namely the guy who values it more. Well, I value Redmond's wallet more than Redmond does, let's say. Well, on that basis, I should get it. So I, we have serious disagreements as to the interpretation of what Coe said. I would just say, you know, read it again or read what I wrote or, you know, well, I, you know, put up your dukes. We'll settle this, we'll settle this rationally. Uh, yes, a guy in the, last question. Last question, yeah. A guy in the bow tie. Well, the best thing on environmental economics is this thing that Murray Rothbard wrote, but then again, Murray Rothbard wrote the best thing on most things. Uh, get his uh, uh, essay, I think it was in the Cato Journal. I'm not sure. It's on Mises. It's on Mises. I'm looking at it now. It's on Mises Web. Uh, it, it just look uh, Coase uh, uh, Social Costs or, or Rothbard, uh, uh, sorry, Coase Social Costs would be the other article. Rothbard Air Pollution. I'm sure you'll get that, Google. Thanks for your attention. Yes. We are going ahead to the last uh, lecture. And look who's everybody still here. You know? So
Yeah, yeah well, uh, okay, well, if you're expecting a big screw up, maybe, but. Um, <laughs> So the talk is called The Locavorce Dilemma. So Redmond's uh, plugged everybody's book but mine. So I have a few copies for $10. Uh, it's not just about food. It's also about peak oil, among other things. So it ties into the previous talk I gave because one argument made by people who believe that we should have uh, more local food production is that we're going to run out of oil pretty soon. So we'll have no choice but to go back into that. So there's actually a fair amount of uh, energy discussion in this. So uh, $10, taxes included. OK, so the locavores dilemma in praise of the 10,000 mile diet. So basically what the talk is about is this fad that uh, people of your age group have probably been um, bombarded with since you entered high school or before, in uh, which you're told that the way to become more sustainable is to sort of go back to our roots and enjoy food and stuff. So as I will mention shortly, there are different reasons to go local. And if you go for, uh, for it for you know, better taste, better quality, then fine. But if you, go, uh, if you buy into local food for reasons that have uh, nothing to do with why you would buy food in the first place, then what I will argue is a, uh, this is a bad idea because none of the arguments put forward by uh, local food activists actually can withstand scrutiny. So uh, in case you're not familiar with this, uh, herbivores eat plants, carnivores eat meat, and locavores eat local. So as you probably know, though, this movement is about more than just uh, food because you can go online and easily find something like this and have zero uh, skills in terms of coming up with you know graphic art so trust me I didn't do that you can't buy happiness but you can buy local and that's kind of the same thing so feelings location I'm a geographer I kind of I'm still looking for happiness on a map but you know <laughs> I can't really find it uh, in our society growing food yourself has become the most radical of acts it is uh, truly the only effective protest one can and will overturn the corporate powers that be by the process of directly working in harmony with nature, we do the one thing most essential to change the world, we change ourselves. Now, the way I look at that, you know, I was born in Quebec in 1969, where bombs were still blowing up in Westmount and Montreal. So if that's the most radical thing that young people will do, I can sort of live with that. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's more than just food. You know, it's putting it to the agreement or something. Now, the funny thing, of course, is that as this movement gained popularity, it was obviously embraced by corporations who thought they could make a buck out of it. And uh, Walmart, of all uh, corporations, developed its heritage agricultural project um, in which local areas that already produce a lot of food could market the food as being local. And so they had this I-95 corridor project on the East Coast the Mid-American State Project, the Delta State Project, where you, know, you walk into a Walmart and you will see uh, local food being displayed and marketed as such. So obviously the movement has been successful. If you've brought Walmart on your side, you know, you've obviously achieved something. But what are the reasons put forward to promote buying local food? Well, again, this is something I found online. Locally grown food tastes better. Apparently, always, everywhere, the local soil has some magical property, which means that every local place you go, the food tastes better. Okay. Local produce is better for you. Local food preserves genetic diversity. Local food is safe. I don't know when was the last time you went to Mexico. Well, okay, I shouldn't say that. Yeah, this is being taped. Okay. Local food supports local family. Local food builds community. Local food preserves open space. Local food keeps your taxes in check. Local food supports a clean environment and benefits wildlife, and local food is about the future. The future. Yeah, but think about it. You know, it's in the future the same sense that backward is the new forward, right? So this is a, a painting from um, a typical market down in Great Britain about a century ago, before supermarkets really came along and took the form that we now think of today when we think of a supermarket. Which first, obviously, then raises the first question. You know, if things were so great when the world was fairly close to the ideal that local wars are, not promo are now promoting, why was the globalized food supply chain developed in the first place? Because we had a world that was fairly similar to what local food activists are now pushing for. Why did so many people work so long and so hard to develop the globalized food supply chain? 
And if you go back further in time, well, most people were de facto lo uh, locavores. So these are Irish peasants here growing their potatoes, uh, sub-Saharan African peasants today. Uh, most of what these people eat is local food. So again, is this the future ideal that we're being pushed towards? Yeah, I know, Karen, you can't wait to, we'll, we'll argue later. Uh, but the fact is that for most of human history, even in the largest cities, let's say Paris in the 17th century, Florence in the 14th, uh, most of the food came within a 50 kilometer radius. Uh, you might have heard of the 100-mile uh, diet, or as I like to call it, the 161.2-kilometer diet. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you would eat food in Paris a few centuries ago. Most of it was grown in the Ile de France region, right around Paris, because moving food over long distances was problematic. And so having chickens in your backyards or even pigs in your basement was what you would find in all places the world over, because... Uh, fresh food did not travel. There was no refrigeration. There was no modern means of transportation. And so any city that you went, uh, that you went around the world over, you know, from China to even the Americas before uh, the Spaniards showed up, you would see animals being, keep, uh, being kept in houses and uh, in backyards. And it was not because they were pets. It's because they were, you know, high quality proteins waiting to be eaten. What about dairy products? Well, it was even worse. I mean, uh, if moving an live animals around was difficult, think of something like milk. And so again, two centuries ago, all the milk that was consumed in London, that was before pasteurization, I know, I know, I know, Karen, I'm sure, uh, was actually produced within the city of London because you couldn't move milk over long distances. So all these yellow spots here are uh, dairy sheds where local uh, cows are being fed either urban garbage or animal feed that was trucked in uh, from the countryside. Now, most people in those days didn't eat too well. So this is actually a real building uh, in Dunmore, Scotland, which was built by the Earl of Dunmore in the late 18th century. Now, it's obviously a pineapple. Why would he build a building in the shape of a pineapple? Well, th because this was a greenhouse where he would actually produce pineapples. So pineapples were quote unquote discovered by Europeans when Columbus reached the Caribbean. But obviously you couldn't ship fresh pineapples on a wooden ship from the Caribbean to Scotland. So if you wanted pineapples, you needed to build your greenhouses and produce them yourselves. And in those days, greenhouses were not very efficient. You needed a cold stove, a staff on retainer 24 hours a day. But the Earl of Dunmore really liked his pineapple. And so he would give them to his guest, who had probably never tasted a pineapple, because in today's dollars, producing pineapples was about $3,000 for one pineapple. You could actually buy uh, a coach, uh, a, stage, uh, a coach for that, so a carriage. Um, and so the only people who really ate well year-round in the past were very wealthy people who could actually afford greenhouses, which is why, until again, not too long ago, uh, aristocrats in Europe and wealthy people were severely, seriously taller than poorer people, perhaps four, five, six inches on average. And that's because the very few wealthy people could have good nutrition year round, whereas poor people couldn't. Okay, so progress, life moves on, cities rise, middle class emerge in the 19th century. Uh, people want to eat more fresh food year round. And so very ingenious means are devised to produce that stuff. So this is Paris in the 19th uh, century. So back then, uh, until maybe 1880, 1890, one sixth of the Paris area is still devoted to food production. And these guys produce about 100,000 tons of produce year round. How do they do it? Well, look at a few things here. First, look at the tree in the back here. You can see that here? Okay. So it's the winter, obviously. So how are people able to produce things like green asparagus in the winter? Well, all these gardens are surrounded by walls, which act as windbreakers that will give you a few additional degrees. Uh, you create a microclimate. Then you, go thing, you grow things are, uh, under cloche, which are those glass containers. Everything is then soaking in horse manure. This is before cars come, uh, comes along. So they produce their stuff. They truck it. They produce, produce. They truck it to the city. They bring back manure. You put a cloche on top of that. Uh, there's uh, artificial CO2 fertilization in the process, a few more degrees of heat are created. And on top of that, you put dark straw mats uh, to draw more sunlight. You know, the darker it is, if you remember what I told you about forests causing more global warming, according to some, well, in that case, additional heat was good. You know, life likes heat. 
So uh, for the only time in my life, reading French was actually an asset in my case, because I could buy, go back to the original Parisian sources. And one thing I learned is that uh, Parisian truck farmers, or uh, maraîchers as we call them in French, said that they only gain uh, a modicum of respect from their uh, contemporaries when they were able to produce green asparagus year-round, and that occurred in the 1820s. Before that, a lot of people were producing food around cities, but you know, producing green asparagus in January required a lot of skill. And uh, they were actually uh, respected, and you would have rich people showing up to the, local, the best local garden to get the best produce. They would buy it in advance, what have you. And by the late 19th centuries, they grew all sorts of things, including pineapples. Now, I haven't been able to find the price of a pineapple, of a local pineapple in Paris in the late 19th century. I'm still looking for it. But it was, it was obviously less than $3,000, but it was obviously a lot more than what you would pay today. So just a look uh, at these technologies. Uh, Paris is really the gold standard. If you read the literature, well, at least in French and English, I don't read German, they say that Parisian producers are better than in London or any other large city the world over. So some of the technologies, some, still are, uh, some things are still grown under cloche as late as 1921. Uh, they would stack them, they develop little things, they produce their own straw mats, again, to create a few additional degrees. Now, the system is local up to a degree, meaning that the system ultimately relies on horse manure and the animal feed is trucked in from longer distances. And by the late 19th century, an insignificant portion of it actually comes from the United States. So you bring in horse food and the horses do their things and that's how the system is powered. So it's not completely local, but still a lot of stuff is produced locally which does raise the question of what is local food really. So a few more technologies. You can see they were very innovative. Greenhouses, the greenhouse technology evolves in the late 19th century. They even power stuff with it by windmills here. Uh, they recycle sewage water. Uh, some big installations out of Paris, actually no, north of Paris in that case. And ultimately the system collapses though. People give up on that, and all that stuff is abandoned. So if you go around Paris today, uh, I don't suggest you uh, go into these neighborhoods. These are the kind of neighborhoods where people tend to burn their cars on a regular basis. So uh, public housing back there. But you can see leftovers uh, from that period of time. You see, again, so those maraîchers, they were around the city. So typically what would happen, uh, they would rent a piece of land, they would produce food, then the city would grow, then they would relocate, they would relocate. So these things are really... You can see some leftovers on the outskirts of Paris. But then railroads become very significant. And suddenly, as they become more efficient, better organized, you can ship stuff from the Mediterranean coast to Paris very quickly. And it so happens that along the Mediterranean, nature gives you the heat free of charge. So you don't need to work 17, 18 hours a day like a lot of these guys used to uh, to produce the stuff. And you can actually produce it cheaper. And so within a matter of years, this whole system falls apart because local producers in Paris cannot compete against nature in places like southern France, northern Italy, uh, southern Spain, things like that. Then uh, steamboats also come along, steamships. Uh, at first they use boat sails and uh, steam technology, but suddenly things like frozen lamb from New Zealand can be sent very cheaply to Europe. Uh, ships were, uh, sheeps were first grazed in New Zealand for their wool, so New Zealanders had way too much meat, they didn't know what to do with it. Suddenly this technology comes along, and they find a market in Europe, and suddenly meat becomes affordable to uh, poorer people. Now I'm a geographer, I've got to show you a few maps just so that you understand the 19th century transport revolution. The white lines here are the sail ship routes of the time. The problem if you have a sailboat is that you've got to negotiate with wind uh, patterns and ocean currents. You can tack against the wind, but it will take you a long time. It's just not economical to do so. But then you've got steel ships who come along who can be a lot bigger, and you can go against the wind, against the current. So suddenly, the whole world becomes a production zone that can supply rich places like uh, Western Europe and North America. So the transportation revolution in the 19th century really opens up production zones, which up to that point in time could not supply, uh, economically at least, places like uh, Paris. So by the late 19th century, this is a picture I took in a mining uh, museum in Montana a number of years ago. They recreated what the general store looked like around 1890. 
So in a place like Montana, you can find olive oil, cod, sugar, coffee, cocoa, tea, spices, frozen meat, and some produce that come from a fair distance away. And even gold miners in Montana won't subsist on local food. You know, if they can have olive oil, they will have olive oil. They will have coffee. They will have tea. Now I'm an economic geographer for a living. We're not too numerous in the walls of academia, but we've been around for a while. So this is a 1903 economic geography textbook, which explains the globalization that has occurred in the previous years by discussing a typical middle class New York City breakfast. So the bread will be made of wheat that was grown in Minnesota, the coffee will come from Sumatra or Java, the tea from China, the sugar from Cuba. They weren't yet communists in those days. Uh, the meat from Texas prepared in St. Louis and spices from all sorts of tropical location. Uh, all these things the textbook author tells you are found in the great majority of households and people are happy with that. And this is a local market in New York City about a century ago. The image is not very good, but I want to draw your attention to the one item which is very present. Uh, if you cannot see it, you know, these are bananas. Bananas are the first tropical fruits that travel over long distances. Why? Well, first of all, nature provides the packaging free of charge, which is important. And then uh, bananas won't ripen unless you give them uh, triggering conditions in warehouses. Uh, I won't get into the details, but bananas can be produced che cheaply, moved over long distances, stored for a period of time, and then you can trigger the, rap uh, the ripening later on. And so what the textbook author writes is that the dwelling of Western civilization and its various furnishing, unlike the log house of the frontiersman of a century or two ago, is a product of almost the whole world. And it's a good thing. People are happy in the 19 and 1900 not to have to subsist on local food anymore. So what happens then in the late 19, early 20th century is that um, large cities all have local food system kind of similar to Paris, not as developed, not as efficient, not as diverse, but still you've got local food everywhere. But urban agriculture is driven out every, in all advanced economies. Why is that? Well, cities are growing and you can just produce more value doing other things than growing local food. Then there are public health concerns. Uh, you know, keeping dairy cows next door is a good way to transmit uh, diseases of all kinds, not to say nothing of the smell. And nobody wants to work in horse manure 18 hours a day anymore if they can get a factory job. They'll get more money, uh, more sensible hours, and people move out of urban agriculture en masse. They, there are better alternatives that are now available. <laughs> Now, in terms of agricultural areas, because of the transportation revolution, places like the Argentinian Pampas, the Canadian prairies, uh, the Australian outback open up and are able to supply uh, food to distant markets. Then uh, new types of uh, food are grown in traditional subsistence farming zones. And in many places, uh, land that was not very productive, but that needed to be farmed because you could not move things over long distances is abandoned. So the outcome of all of that is that you see um, regional specialization in all advanced economies. So a, a common line used by people like Michael Pollan, for example, who's kind of the guru of the local food movement, is that, well, uh, regional specialization is really an artifact of cheap petroleum prices, but as we all know, we're going to run out of it soon. Prices will go up, so we will revert back to a more diversified local food system like we had in the past. Apparently unbeknown to Poland is that in the age of coal, specialization was already dominating the landscape. So in the United States in 1920, you've got the cotton belt, you've got the subtropical crops in Florida, uh, Southern California, grazing land here, spring wheat in the north, the dairying mixed farming here, the corn belt, corn and winter wheat between the cotton and the corn belt. Why? Well, because as was mentioned by other lecturers, for obvious reasons, growing corn in the Midwest is a good proposition, whereas growing corn uh, in, the, in the desert isn't really. And then latitude plays a role. So things like potatoes are still grown pretty much everywhere, but what would have happened in the past before the railroad came along is that uh, potatoes would be grown in, let's say, the Long Island of uh, Walter Block's youth, but uh, then potatoes would be stored for several months and you would eat local potatoes for a long time. What the railroad makes possible is to eat fresh potatoes year round. How does that happen? Well, as you can see here, this is a map produced in the early uh, 20th uh, century. If you plant potatoes in Florida, you'll get your crop uh, ready in late March. 
And you go up in north all the way up to the St. John River Valley here in Maine, and the potatoes are ready in September. So in a place like New York, for example, the first potatoes you will, he uh, you will eat in the year will actually come from Bermuda, which even though is Bermuda has a more northern latitude than Florida, but it's in the Gulf Stream, and so they would get potatoes before everybody else. They would ship it to uh, New York. And then the Florida potatoes would arrive, then the Georgia potatoes, then the local potatoes for a few weeks during the year, and then uh, the main potatoes. So people would rather eat fresh potatoes year round than subsist on local potatoes that have to be stored. Uh, won't taste as good. You will lose some to uh, pests and diseases and things like that. And then you've got the rise of centralized uh, food processing facilities. So this is the Chicago Meatpacking District in uh, the rail uh, era. So uh, Chicago is in the heart of the Midwest. They can be supplied uh, cattle, livestock from all over the United States. Why is it then that uh, the killing of animals now occurs in a central location like Chicago and to a lesser extent in places like Kansas City and Omaha, rather than having local butchers as was the case in the past? Well, because there are such things as economies of scale and what really makes the Chicago packing district profitable is what I was mentioning earlier, the capacity to turn waste into valuable byproducts. So a local butcher would sell the meat and probably the letter, but then would throw everything away, uh, the bones, the sinews, whatever was left. Whereas the Chicago meat packers, because of the sheer volume of waste, had an incentive to invest in developing byproduct out of waste and were able to make money out of this. And so as a result, they could do two things. They could pay more for a live animal than the local butcher could, and they could paradoxically sell the meat cheaper because they were generating all that wealth from the byproducts. So I won't get into the details here, but suffice it to say that uh, before plastics became available, a lot of stuff like, you know, uh, combs, uh, pins, what have you, would be made out of animal bones, whereas these things would obviously be made out of plastic today. Okay, so in the last few decades, we've experienced another transportation revolution, which was the advance, uh, the, uh, the rise of intermodal container shipping. So in the past, many boats would actually, many cargo ships would actually spend more time in ports than on the open ocean. Today with uh, container shipping, you can move things around a lot faster. A big boat, a big uh, container boat can be in a, in a harbor for maybe 24 hours, whereas in the past it would have needed to be there for two or three months. And so you can move fresh things around. You've got things also like reefers or refrigerated containers. Uh, they're all white. Why is that? At this point, you know, it will not absorb sunlight. They will reflect it. So whenever you see those white containers with this little refrigerating unit in the back, you know, they're moving frozen or refrigerated stuff. Uh, air cargo also became uh, available for very typically more expensive items that need to be uh, delivered quickly. So flowers, uh, high-grade sushi fish, that's that kind of stuff. Then, uh, unlike Cuba, most other, most other communist countries rejoined the International Division of Labor. So Vietnam, China came along. Uh, there's a reason today why most of the apple juice that we consume is from China, and that's because about 70% 70, uh, 70 of the cost of producing apples in Canada is labor. And uh, not a lot of my students, and I assume not a lot of you, want to be apple pickers for a living. So, you know, the kind of apples that end up in, you know, juices, pastry, whatever, typically now come from China because you can still find people willing to work in that uh, line of business. But, of course, now you've got Kenyan producers of all sorts of produced things, uh, Vietnamese shrimps, what have you. Okay, so this is why our system evolved the way it did. Another thing that is lost on many local food activists is that they're but the latest generation to promote local food. I would suspect that local food movements are just as old as long distance trade. And so in the book, I cover some of that history and I wanna write the definitive book on the topic in my next sabbatical. I just wanna thank you taxpayers. That's gonna happen next year. Uh, so why were there so many local food uh, movements in the past? Well, every time there's an economic downturn, people say, well, we should at least grow our food or at least it happens spontaneously. Uh, war times, romanticism, and people don't like uh, transportation companies and retailers. So in the United States, the first local food movement uh, was launched by uh, proto-hippies, more on them in a couple of minutes, but you had things like the urban potato patches movement in the 1890s, garden city plot, school garden, so a quick thing over that. So how many of you are familiar with the New England transcendentalists? Walter, I guess, yeah. 
Okay, well, basically, they're kind of uh, intellectuals who want to go back to the land. Uh, they're happy with the way industrialization is beginning, and so they say, well, let's move to the countryside. We'll have an orchard. We'll create a school, and we'll produce our local food, and we'll cut ourselves. You know, we won't touch rice, tea, coffee, stuff like that. Um, Bronson Alcott, the father of Louisa May Alcott, Little Women, if that, yeah, no, libertarian guys don't know much about that, I guess, uh, is one of the most radical uh, local food activists of the 1840s. So what he wants to do uh, in his, uh, on his uh, little plot of land, well, people will have a simple diet, uh, mostly fruits and water, that's why it's called Fruitlands. No stimulants, so that's no tea, coffee, or things like that, or animal products, that would include honey, things like that. And you say, well, it will eliminate the need for trade and minimize labor. So in practice, no tea, coffee, molasses, rice, no meat, butter, cheese, egg, or milk. They were ethical vegans, actually. But also no wool, manure, wax, and animal labor. Uh, also no vegetables that grew downwards. Still not quite sure why, so carrots, beets, and potatoes were not acceptable and because they showed a lower nature. And no cotton, and I'll cut him some slack there. Uh, that's because cotton was still produced by slaves at the time. So as you can imagine, this experiment lasted about five months. The fall came and the people said, well, we're cold, we're hungry, we're out of here. <laughs> okay, so in war times, obviously, um, you know, there are such things as U-boat in the North Atlantic, so there's a strong incentive to go local. Um, this is a 1917 poster of uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which would not be out of place in many farmers' markets today. So, make backyards and make it look productive, work a garden, raise chickens, somebody has to raise or pack everything you eat, do your share. And so people actually convert, as you can see, their front lawn and their backyards into food-producing areas. But the thing is that these movements never last beyond one the, once the war is over. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, you don't see Michelle Obama on this one because this was taken a century ago, but this is actually not too far from the White House, so uh, 1917. Uh, so in the early 20th century, there's a fear among well-to-do people, that would be the ladies here, that immigrant children are too cut off from nature. And so promoting school gardens, they believe, is a way to uh, help kids understand how nature works, and that's important. So you don't see the ladies doing a lot of work here, but the kids surely are. So a few popular books at the time among school garden. This one is 1910, I believe, and one 1904, Children's Garden for School and Home, for Schools and Home. So there's a big movement among educational reformer to promote growing food in school backyards. Uh, during economic hard times, so uh, rich people are encouraged to let poor people grow their potatoes in city vacant lots. So this is a movement here, fresh vegetables from vacant lot garden to help poor people at least earn some money. Um, the expression back to the land is actually not something that appeared in the 1960s with the hippies, even though it was mostly associated with that, but it was promoted at the turn of the 20th century where you had an economic depression and people believe, well, uh, economic, economic growth has run its course, let's go back to the land and let's learn to live modestly and within our means again. Uh, during the depression, so Youngstown, Ohio, you can see the steel plants in the back and the, the uh, gardens that are being promoted to cope with the depression. Uh, subsistence homestead in West Virginia, so this was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's pet project. They dumped a lot of money to uh, subsidize people being essentially self-sufficient. Uh, one thing that is forgotten is that agricultural economics got its starts in the U.S. Uh, to a large extent by studying local food movements. So the U.S. really ramps up food production during the First World War. Uh, then the Europeans get back into the business of producing food. There's a big drop in uh, agricultural markets then. And some people promote local food as an alternative. And so a lot of agricultural economists in the 1920s actually get subsidized by the government to study those local food movements. And those that are honest say that it's a waste of time and resources, but you know, we never quite learn about that. Uh, then a lot of people hate retailers and uh, railroad companies. So uh, if you follow the local food movement, this was not from a few years ago, this was from a century ago, strawberries. It seems, you know, why do we buy California strawberries when we have Ontario strawberries? Well, a century ago, the uh, center of strawberry production in the United States was not California, but rather Delaware and the surrounding areas. And so there's somebody here who complained that strawberries that are produced in Delaware are shipped to Philadelphia, then they're sent back to another uh, warehouse closer back to Delaware, which are then sold to other people, and then after a few days, uh, they go back 14 miles to where they were produced. Isn't that a waste of resources? 
So any quality left in the berries after the last leg of this roundabout journey is due rather to the providence of God than the wisdom of men. So, you know, intermediaries don't create any value. Uh, same movements outside of the United States, I'll spare you that. So in Scotland during the Depression, World War II, in uh, Great Britain, the movement is known as Dig for Victory, so school kids, local food. This is not a local food activist, this is just a good British citizen in the Second World War producing as much food as he can uh, in his backyard. I have a little video, but I don't have time to show it to you. Okay, so they don't like merchants and railroad companies in Britain either. Okay, my favorite local food movement, though, is uh, something that was called the Empire Marketing Board in the 1920s, where a local market is defined as the British Empire. So uh, growing export trade is the basis of British property. You know, keep your money in the empire. You know, that's, that's what is local. Another thing that is conveniently forgotten is that strong promoters of local food in the past included people like, you know, Benito Mussolini, uh, Ceausescu in Romania, Joseph Stalin in Russia. Uh, they, all, they were all in favor of local foods for reasons, yeah. It, it was not really to save the environment, I'll leave it at that. So uh, the Battaglia del Grano, one of Mussolini's first policies to break what he calls the slavery of, it of Italians who have to make their pasta with wheat that comes from Hungary, Canada, the United States, and Australia. You can't have that, right? And so, you know, that's actually Mussolini here, in case you're wondering. So, you know, helping to promote um, wheat production. The problem is that, you know, there's a reason why the Romans, in the days of the Roman Empire, imported their wheat from other places. Italy kind of sucks to grow wheat. They're good at making pasta, it's not really good. So uh, Mussolini will win is, um, is bad. I mean, Italy will become somewhat self-sufficient in wheat. The problem is that um, they have to cut down citrus orchards, uh, olive groves, and places like that to grow the stuff. So the price of wheat goes up a lot, and the diet of the average Italian actually goes down as a result. So in the end of uh, what is local and why don't these movements ever last? Well, because there are really no benefits. Nobody would bother importing food from long distances if local alternatives were better. In a free market, that just wouldn't happen. So first stating the obvious, uh, we don't import food from outer space. We can all agree on that, okay? So the implication is that good quality, affordable food needs to be grown somewhere on Earth, and sometimes people will live next to it. So of course, in some cases, local food makes sense. There's no point are you denying that. So obviously a local food movement cannot be simply in favor of local food when local food is the best alternative. People will buy it anyway. It is to promote local food for other consideration that trumps affordability, nutrition, safety, and taste. So in other words, local food activists must by definition promote local food beyond what the market would deliver, beyond what consumers would spontaneously buy of their own volition. In terms of social capital, uh, so again, Local food activists today are not different than a century ago. They think that supermarkets don't add any value. Uh, the barcode and the brand brands don't add anything. Um, trust your neighbors, you can meet them, and so they will never screw you, right? Well, historically, actually, that's kind of what happened. I mean, there's a reason why brands emerge. I won't get into that, but that's a German immigrant to the United Kingdom who um, makes a lot of money saying that, oh, you know, they're adding uh, rice flour to their milk, uh, they're adding water to their beer, you cannot trust people. Um, you still have the same issue today. Uh, often a lot of the stuff that you buy at local farmer's market is only local in as much as it was bought at the local Costco. I mean, I won't get into the details here, but there's some evidence of that. Uh, so that's why brands actually emerge historically to instill trust between consumers and purchasers who didn't, uh, between producers and consumers who didn't know each other. So Quaker Oats was one of the first brands to emerge in the United States. The founders were not Quakers, but Quakers were a good marketing tool because they had the reputation of being trustworthy. But the point of a box of Quaker Oats uh, oatmeal was that it would be the same box whether you bought it in Buffalo, Los Angeles, Chicago, or other places. You could trust the brand, and that's why brand emerged in the first place because uh, a big company like that has a lot at stake. It will actually be sued by a lawyer if it lies to you, whereas the fly-by-night operator at your local farmer's market won't be. Other problems, uh, direct arrangements between farmers and um, consumers typically result in higher price, inconvenient pickup locations and time, and no flexibility. So uh, buying the amount of food that you want and the quantity that you want when you want it is something that is worth paying for. That's why supermarkets emerge in the first place. And if you buy your food in several months in advance, as is often the case in those arrangements, uh, you know, things might happen. Your kids might decide to go at some point, spend the summer at a camp, something, and so uh, you'll end up with too much food, which you could always give to the neighbor, or 
put in your compost pile, but that's kind of a waste of resources. The result, uh, we argue in the book, my wife and I, I should have said that I have a quarter on this, uh, less money and less time to invest in other ways to build social capital. So less money to give to a local charity, sponsor a local event, coach Little League Soccer, what have you. In terms of economic prosperity, I'll go quickly uh, since you're so sophisticated. Uh, much higher costs for your food, therefore less money to spend on other things. Overall, the job creation effect is actually a job destruction effect. Uh, no urbanization economies of scale and transformation, which played a crucial role historically, as I was telling you. And what about poor farmers in less advanced economies whose comparative advantage is food production? You know, if local food is to help poor people, well, what about the really poor people that you could actually help by buying stuff from them? Environmental sustainability. So how many of you are familiar with the notion of food miles? So the idea is that, you know, modern transportation relies on uh, fossil fuels. You burn them, you emit CO2, that's bad. So why have all this trucking when you can have the apple falling from the tree to your plate without anything in between? So why would you import from an island that produces uh, both, let's say, dates, palm trees, and apple trees? If you find that island, please let me know. So in miles are only valid when everything else is equal. The problem, of course, in real life is that not everything is equal. Even if you compare environments that might look similar, like uh, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, you know, foggy islands where it rains a lot, uh, New Zealanders can actually, using the same amount of resources, produce three times more apple, four times more lamb, and two times more milk solid in the United Kingdom. Uh, among other things, that's because their pasture land is of much better quality than that of the UK, and you don't need to give supplemental feed uh, to your dairy cows. Now, transportation. Well, there are different ways to move things around. You can have a big container ship that floats on water, that has huge diesel engines, that burn the uh, bunker fuel, which can get you an apple from New Zealand to uh, Long Beach or Los Angeles for about one cent per apple versus a local pickup with a few bags of apples that will burn the same amount of energy to cover a few miles per apple. So again, there are economies of scale in transportation too. Then latitude, remember what I told you about apples, uh, about uh, potatoes a century ago? Well, you've got the reason why we get so much stuff from Chile or New Zealand at certain times of the year here is that in the southern hemisphere, seasons are inverted. So in Canada, we pick our apples in, let's say, September or October. In New Zealand, they pick them in March or April. So it actually makes sense in March or April to import apples from New Zealand because they don't need to spend six months in cold storage. And at certain times of the year, you go to New Zealand and you will see that even though it's the biggest kiwi producing country in the world, it will have Italian kiwis. Why is that? Well, because it makes more sense at certain times of the year to import kiwis from Italy rather than keep local kiwis in storage for several months. So the system works both ways. So you will find Canadian apples perhaps in New Zealand. But overall, the point is that transportation really is insignificant compared to irrigation water, eating greenhouses, or what have you. So one study says that about 4% of the energy footprint of food production in North America is transportation. 83% is everything else. Again, pumping the water, pesticides, what have you. You've seen that, I won't get into that. So a lot of people don't like monocultures today, but the fact is that by concentrating food production in the best locations and by producing what is the most suitable thing in the local environment, a lot of marginal agricultural land was abandoned in North America and elsewhere. So you actually promote biodiversity by having large scale, highly efficient monocultures. Uh, food security. The idea is that, well, what about the Irish potato famine? You know, what happens if uh, your corn or your soybean disappear? Well, nothing bad will happen to you because local food activists tend to forget that what they're basically telling you is to put all your eggs in one regional basket. And historically, that was a recipe for disaster. Uh, so you, can, uh, you see here some uh, grass-fed antibiotic uh, livestock from South Africa a century ago, so you can see how happy they look. That's called a rinder pest cattle plague, so they all died. And of course, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people who relied on them, African people, died, but the white people didn't. Why? Because the white people could afford to buy food from other locations. Uh, you can have locusts that will eat everything, no matter how diversified your local food system is. Floods, you don't discriminate. The fact is that historically the only thing that put an end to famine is long distance trade. The capacity to move large volumes of food affordably over long distances so that regions that have bad years can rely on regions that have good years and vice versa. It's risk management 101. Spread your food production as far as possible. 
The problem when you, have, uh, when you depend on one region is that you will have bad years, and two bad harvests in a row, you will have a famine, which was the case historically. The one thing that put an end to famine historically was not democracy, it was long distance trade. And this was obvious to everyone who saw the transition from sailboat to steamships and the railroad. Okay, nutrition and safety. So if local food is better because it is fresher, which is an oversimplification, frozen food can be just as nutritious, then local food cannot win because if fresher is the key, well, if you rely on a local diet, things will only be in season a few weeks every year. Then you need to can, freeze, dry, preserve the food one way or the other. Whereas our current system gives us fresh food year round from all sorts of locations. So if fresher is the, is the key, then local food cannot win. Going local will therefore result, as it did in wartime, in uh, lower productivity, less variety, higher food prices. How is that supposed to be good for people? Um, I won't get into that, but if you look at what uh, European countries that were cut off from uh, world uh, trading networks uh, during the, f the two world wars had to do, well, this is exactly what happened. You revert back to local, you produce less, food is more expensive, people are less well nourished. Safety issues. Well, there are such things as economies of scale in catching bad stuff. Uh, there are economies of scale in food safety. Uh, the deadliest outbreak in terms of food occurred, uh, 25 deaths occurred a couple of years ago. Uh, Pesticide-free local farm, uh, listeriosis, cantaloupes. Okay, I don't know if you can see that here. Politically incorrect. Okay, so how can you trust people in China? Well, first of all, it's in nobody's interest to poison their customers. It's kind of not good business. But you should remember that you don't buy food directly from the Chinese producers, but from your supermarket. And it's not in the interest of anyone here to poison their customers. So there are a lot of checkpoints along the way to make sure that the stuff that gets to consumers actually meets criteria. If it doesn't, it's sent back to China, destroyed, or whatever. Conclusion, what are locavores really up against? Occupy the food supply and the corporate exploitation of our food system. Yeah, no, not really. So uh, they're against the local weather. You know, you'll have bad years. That's why you have long distance trades. You know, you'll starve if you only rely on local food. The fact that it makes more sense to grow some types of food in some places rather than others. And again, with container shipping now moving things is so energy efficient, there's just no reason not to rely on natural advantages in other parts of the world. There are such things as economies of scale in terms of production and processing. And large modern cities obviously cannot be fed on local food, but they make people more productive. They're actually better for the environment. So it makes sense to concentrate people in cities and feed them from a, lar from a much larger geographical area. Okay, I don't know if you really have ever heard of that big uh, local food activist of the early uh, eight, 19th century named Napoleon Bonaparte. He liked the British so much that he wanted to encourage them to produce local food by instituting the continental blockade. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Abraham Lincoln, another local food activist, wanted to encourage the South to be a prosper to experience sustainable prosperity, so that's why he blockaded them during the secession, War of Secession. Uh, that other great uh, local food activist, uh, Winston Churchill, who really encouraged Germany to, towards a green path of sustainability and prosperity. You know, there's a reason why we blockade countries during war. Do you think Napoleon and Churchill and Abraham Lincoln were stupid? Okay, now Walter would probably say they were evil, okay, but that's different than being stupid. Okay, I'm just romanticizing the past. So 300, how many of you saw that movie? Okay, I hope that unlike most of my students, this is not where you get your history from. So there are many things that are wrong with this picture. So if you remember King Leonidas of Sparta has a Scottish accent, his body armor is all wrong. Um, this is a calcimide dwarf wheat. This was invented in the 1950s, it did not exist. These are the kind of yields that you would have never seen in Sparta. But the biggest anachronism here are the Spartans themselves. So if you've seen the movie, you know that all the Spartan hoplites are about Charles Butler's stature, right? Butler is six foot three. Now we know from graves and body armors from Spartans that they were about five foot four on average. So local food, international diet. Uh, you saw that little girl again, something I didn't mention. Um, when I was a kid in grade school, they would show us the pictures of starving African kids, and you know, when you starve, your belly sort of, yes. Yeah, but you know, the, the, again, she's from Finland, and look at her belly. She's actually suffering from famine and starvation. Local food here. Local food reality, until the mid-18th century, most European peasants were in a chronic state of undernourishment. Again, it was only long-distance trade and um, produce, concentrating food production in the best locations the world over that uh, put an end to that. 
Localvorism has real consequences, higher costs and greater poverty, no environmental and social benefit, less food security, poor nutrition, and a significant penalty to developing economies. Okay, parting thoughts. Thomas Sutcliffe, more prosperous Australian businessman, the first one to try to uh, ship frozen uh, sheep meat from Australia to England. Uh, he fails, but when he inaugurates his plan, he comes up with a speech that I like a lot. So the time has arrived where we now have steamships and railroad and freezing technology to ship food over long distances, where the various portions of the earth will each give forth their products for the use of each and of all, that the overabundance of one country will make up for the deficiency of another, the superabundance of the year of plenty serving for the scant harvest of its successor. Climate seasons, plenty, scarcity, distance will all shake hands and out of the coming link will come enough and for all. God has produced enough food for people the world over, but the problem is that where the people are, the food is not. Where the food is produced, the people are not, but it is within the power of men to address such things. Another quote here, 1915, back to the land is an idle dream. We can no more restore the pastoral age and we can go back to the spindle of noon. There's a reason why the global food supply chain was developed and I believe that um, my book was the first to sort of remind people of that. So $10, freely available, I'm happy to sign it. Thank you very much. Well, it's up to you. I mean, or would you want to start a Q&A and people can ask? Uh, let's take a break right now and then yeah. we'll have our general panel for